Any links that we should have in the description of the stream? Like, oh, go to this sponsor, etc. Uh, there's a website up and running that the sponsor actually made for us. I, we could link that. Yeah, should we should be a link for that, please. And then you could include CPR as well, where this tournament is happening, if you wanted to. Yep, absolutely. Everyone who's relevant and welcome is you know is welcome. But CPR is a bit of a mess to look at right now. Don't be, don't be alarmed when you see it. <laughs> there's way too many channels. It's like maneuver around. You might not actually even find the two v two. You need to get uh, to the signed rules and actually check the two v two row to see it. Yes, the it's kind of like it's a victim of its own success. <laughs> Not sure about that, but yeah. Well, like it, we'll well, get it we'll get it looking pretty yeah, soon. Are you one of the admins on CPL, Corny? No, but uh, and we talked about this before a little bit. But we were running like this player experience study as well, right? To like hopefully streamline some of the ways that people get into CPL. Make it more yes. enjoyable for everyone. Honestly, the best way to get people into CPL is to get people like me to actually play in it. <laughs> but yeah, probably. Um, did you? All right, potato. The checks in the mail. <laughs> hey, if you want to sponsor me, oh, someone. <laughs> someone linked the chat uh, in chat already. The website, by the way. Oh, there we go. Okay, Civ plays Cupnet. And then I need to actually make my stream go live on YouTube. And then once it's live, I will have the brain power to actually have a real conversation. <laughs> And then once it's live. I mean, hey, Potato, conversation is not mandatory for a fun stream. We've got four really good players. That's We've true. got, I think the main difference, what I've really enjoyed about the 2v2 tournament is uh, how fast it is. Yes. I think yes. you usually know, like usually you're setting up for some sort of tank GDR bullshit, but... <laughs> <laughs> With 2v2, you're basically, you know, around turn 50, you sort of know how the game is going to swing. Yes, and you're scrapping from like minute one, right? Yeah, exactly. And uh, it's very entertaining to watch too. I think the, the thing that I'm really interested in, in the 2v2 side of things, as compared to the 4v4 that we watched uh, and like casted, is and I actually I said this to Corny earlier, is that in a two v two, you don't have you can't have people who specialize right because in a four v four one guy can be like okay I'll be the gold guy I'll feed or carry and then he'll build a big army you kind of got to build a balanced empire while fighting almost constantly. Very true. Also, like in a four v four, it might be very easy for you to get lost in like what everyone else is doing. In a two v two, it's way more focused. Like you can keep track of not just your ally, yourself, and your enemy, but like, a, yeah, but all, basically of all the win conditions happening because they're right in front of you. It's yes. It makes casting as well a lot easier. Lots yeah, there's a lot less information to keep track of. And I also, I like the idea of when there's a 4v4, and you guys will probably like agree with me here, usually one of the players on a team kind of like takes over in terms of both the talking and the actual gameplay state whereas in a 2v2 it's got to be like a dude can you do this guy you do am i i'm going to cover this you do and it's like a lot of you have to like distribute tasks between two people so there's a lot more interplay between those two whereas like sometimes in a 4v4 it's like okay i need you to just pump out horsemen so that you can make your neighbor a rel i mean this might be not entirely what you were saying but like the, the voice chat is like a lot more clearer you get to talk a lot more about what you want to do with your buddy like it feels like more of like a friendly thing as well yes it's with, more intimate with. whereas 4v4 so like definitely yeah it's about the team everyone has to say something at some point you don't get to talk about everything because everyone wants to say something yes 
I mean, I know I, I said this to you before as well, but like when I started playing, I would have really liked like something like this to exist, where you can just you know hop in with a buddy, play against the random people online, call it quits after two hours or something like this. I agree. I think jumping into a free for all is intimidating, especially as a new player, because um, veteran players are like sharks; they're going to smell that newbie blood in the water. And they're going to be coming yeah. for you because they want that MMR. It's all people in the lobby, though, here. Like, you can kind of pick your opponents as well. Yes. Um, I'm just trying to find the 2v2. Okay, there they are. Give me a shout when the lobby's up and I'll, uh, I'll join the thingy. There is the lobby up now. I'll send you the link. Thank you very, very much. Potato, when is the next Saver Die session? Uh, next Wednesday, I believe. We will be playing more Dungeons and Dragons. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, we do like a little Dungeons and Dragons show. Saver Die every Wednesday at 8.30 p.m. GMT. 3.30 uh, EST 9.30 CET <laughs> so I'm going to be spectator 1 and I will mm, I think we were asked to go into the second slot by the way okay in that's case, no problem like uh, host disconnects then I could obviously I always goes to like the person that's first in the lobby I think we had a, like a designated host afterwards okay perfect I will switch to spectator 2 then Uh, are there, your... Have any of the rules for spectators changed? Because I used to say hi to people when I would join the lobbies. Yeah, you still have to do that. I'm allowed, I'm allowed to say hi? <laughs> yeah, you have to. There, I did a little arm wave emoji. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but... This is your first Twitch stream in a while, though. No, I just haven't. I, I've streamed quite a bit uh, the last couple of months, but I haven't streamed as much as usual because I've just been focused on other stuff right now in my life, um, like personal life stuff. And I've also been focused on trying to just make really good YouTube videos. Uh, but I've also been kind of lazy too. So there's like a little bit of that going on. But what we have to remember is that Potato McWhiskey is actually a full time rabbit dad. True. We can't forget that those are the most important duties in a man's life. I'm, I'm <laughs> single rabbit dad, by the way. Like, I'm, I'm doing that on my own, all right? And that's, that's hard. That's really life. hard. It is. <laughs> <laughs> um, Society so, so, doesn't provide enough support for single rabbit dads. They really don't. They really do not. I, uh, you know, where's my child tax credit, you know? All that stuff. Yeah. Free rabbit. rabbit daycare. Where is it? Free rabbit daycare. God, I wish <laughs> I'd just leave her there forever. No, I wouldn't. I'm sorry. I had to apologize. <laughs> she, she looked at me angrily when I said that. Um, Ice Fury CTR actually asked, who do you think is the favorite to win? So uh, the only player that I recognize is Noob and Malm. So I think both of them are going to win. And it doesn't matter that they're on different teams. Okay, but they're <laughs> going to win. <laughs> well, Noob634 is the best player in the world. So... Do there you think so? <laughs> it's uh, it's his tagline. It's his branding. And I think in many cases it is true. I think he needs to work on that branding. Because like when I think like, oh, you know, the best player in the wor world, I'm thinking like names like champion or pro or cool guy. <laughs> I don't go to noob. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's mostly a team game, though, like the competitive scene. It's tough oh. to, to say whether there's even a single best player ever. You can maybe judge a little bit by teams, but even there, there's a lot of discussion. <laughs> I think I think often what arises is there's like a really close, like, jostling for the top five positions. Does that make sense? For sure. And uh, any of those five players could beat any of those other five players on like if they're having a good day if that makes sense oh yeah i mean there's so much rng in this game as well like if everyone just plays perfectly then it's all spawn dependent right 
Mm-hmm. Yep, big time. <laughs> uh, which I think actually, so this is actually a theory that I have about games. Um, I really hate um, competitively perfect games in the sense that games where there's no difference between player starting position. Um, so like StarCraft, well, I, I like StarCraft, right? Um, because the difference between the two players comes from their build order, right? Um, but I really, really like games where there's like a little bit of randomness. And so what I love about Civ is it could be like, yeah, you, you, you spawned on a plane's hill or you didn't. And like that little bit of a perturbation um, across like, you know, a distribution can make games more interesting because in like a perfect world, the best player would win every single game, right? Whereas if there's like a little bit of randomness, people have to adapt a little bit more. And I think that's a way more interesting competitive environment. Fair enough. I mean, uh, this tournament also aimed to reduce exactly that RNG though. If you see right now on your stream though, uh, if you go to the game summary, uh, it says BCY affected city centers and BCY city center yields. This is like uh, uh, an add-on to this mod that you can just select in the options. BCY stands for better city yields, I think. Yeah, I think so. It basically means that same as the five has actually done. Uh, if you settle a flat tile, you always have a three one base. If you settle a hill, you will always have a two two base. Oh. What it really means is it's the Oprah of spawns everyone gets a god spawn you get a god spawn i get a god spawn no more sad spawns. i like that um, yeah, it makes sense in tournament setting right you might not want this in like a standard game you're just playing by yourself yes but i like the approach is that there is a difference between flat and hill and it, they didn't just go like everywhere's a 2-2 i like that difference yeah there's like different options for this as well to select. And it's like super easy. It's just uh, like if you want new age or you want to play it on old age, that kind of thing. Or cool. If you want standard ridges or classic ones. When played up, was he asking me? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, I do like the Oprah style uh giving away good spawns to everyone i think that sort of stuff is okay um i like one aspect of rng i like about the game is also like the distribution of the natural wonders i think it's interesting that you know one player's strategy will revolve around a natural wonder and another player's strategy might revolve around a completely different natural wonder and that'll kind of introduce perturbations into the fabric of the game yeah when surface is a game where you have to adapt a lot Yes. Makes you, makes your brain smoke. <laughs> smoke. Potato, maybe we are due for a played up run. The new patch is, oh, they, they just came out with the Valentine's Day update. Mm. With pasta and uh, couples only restaurants. That sounds like fun. And Noob and I were playing around a little bit with the Lunar New Year update. And there's just, there's a lot of new stuff in played up. I did see there was uh there was like that new valentine update i was kind of excited to play it um i played like a little bit with my nephew i play games with him sometimes mm -hmm. um but he's a troll dude he's such a troll <laughs> he like <laughs> torpedoes our restaurant will like have a great run going he runs over to the telephone he calls like 40 guests no he's such a he's a great kid but he's a he's a he's a big troll he expects his uncle to carry <laughs> dude i I'm always in the kitchen and he's serving and uh, I carry the hell out of him, okay? Sounds like fun if you streamed it. <laughs> uh, sorry for the game. For real, the people want to play it upstream. Next time, next time. <laughs> um... Next time, what? Sorry, I was typing. Played up when played up for real. Mike Man ninety eight asks. <laughs> when played up for real. Banger game. <laughs> it is a banger game. I actually got to meet the um, dev team behind Played Up. Um, they were both super nice guys. Um, super pleasant to talk to. Uh, apart actually, the guy who made Played Up is really good at Dota too. Um, oh. Which was surprising. Is, 
a surprising fact that I learned. He's really, really good. Um, I can't remember what his MMR is, but he's like super good. Um, but he was like a really sweet guy. It was really fun to talk to him about the game. And uh, he was he was actually just like a really genuinely, brilliantly nice person. So it was super fun to uh, to get to meet him. Are they British? Yes, actually. And I think because um, the Yogg's cast, I think, published Played Up with... Yeah, I think the Yogg's cast games published Played Up and Played Up did amazingly for them. So I'm super happy with that. So when I was at the Jingle Jam in December, I got to see a bunch of people, including the um, lead dev. Wow. It was really neat. I wasn't expecting that to be that at all. Um, I felt like a a fish out of water you know I didn't feel like it was weird to be there because I didn't know what to expect Um, but it was super awesome everyone there was like super nice we got to try out some pretty cool food I went to like I ate like vegan takeaway food like fast food it was really nice I got like Ah. a chicken burger that actually tasted like chicken even though it was like Saitan or something Am I to understand that this is the upper echelons of British gaming society potato and you've been rubbing shoulders with them (laughs) I think so I think they're just an old, cool gang of friends. So we have a couple questions about how multiplayer games work and how 2v2 works. Do we want to go over the different ways that people can win in this game? 100%. Let's do it. Let's give an, uh, an explainer. Where do we start? Well, let's start with the expected length of the games. Yeah, I mean, you can probably hope to finish one of these in like at least two hours right like some games are gonna last forever maybe you have some relobbies as well and that might drag out to four but i mean you can call it quits if you'd like but the game is set to end on turn 130 on online speed that's like the score victory option to win this game which can be interesting in some games that makes for like unique gameplay as well sometimes Yes, because players might be like scrambling to cling on in a losing war because they technically still have more score, right? So it can create like really tense moments. Ankarat is the biggest one in the game. Oh, that's like the ooh, like the the end of the game is coming. We need to build Anchor Wat. That's because you get one score per pop in your cities, isn't it? Something along those lines, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and the wonder is, gives you. This score is not too. how games usually turn out, but <laughs> it's something that doesn't usually happen in multiplayer. Yes, but it's like in it's like in StarCraft, right? You have like the super rare base traits. Exactly, exactly. So Anchor yeah. Watt is like the base trait of Civ. I mean, maybe Domination when it's more like that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, true, true. Um, so tell me about what else we can say. How do you win? So there's, there's two ways to win, and it's going to be... Sorry. There's two main ways the game is going to go. It's either going to go uh, by time, and score so after 130 turns whichever team has more score will win the game or it's going to go by a traditional victory domination religion probably not religion but science etc (laughs) religion is like almost impossible to multiply like you can just condemn the units it's like it's like super hard yes i would imagine the only save that would even remotely be able to do it would be byzantium um true and they're probably permabanned I mean, yeah, we talked about this earlier as well, how we had like a limited Civ pool that like this this season focuses more on like the underdogs. You get stuff that isn't usually played in multiplayer. And how next season there will be like more of the meta Civs included as well. And we will see whether people change their opinions maybe about some of those Civs. That will be interesting. That forward. will be really interesting. Um, I do personally, I love the idea of like having a really restricted pool of sieves where you take out all the best sieves so people can experiment with like the kind of lesser, you know, popular sieves. Exactly, exactly. I think that's a really cool idea and I love that for this tournament. Uh, Have have there any like sieves that were considered like this sieve is trash? Are there any sieves that have like come up in this tournament that have actually turned out to be, actually they work really well for 2v2? Sieves that work really well for 2v2 is you ask, yeah? Well... (laughs) Gandhi was a sleeper hit. I think up until now, Gandhi hasn't been played too much in the 4v4 scene. Very true. But, yes. Uh, that that I, was like the question. Are there sieves that were previously considered only okay that kind of sh- shined like sleeper hits? Definitely Congo. Definitely Gandhi as well. Mm. I mean, what's just been played a lot is also Egypt and Nubia. Because mainly because of their unique units that you could just spam without costing any strategics at all. 
dude, the Marion, I used to think the Marion U Chariot Archer was garbage because it was so like expensive, but actually it is like a god tier archer unit. It's so it's, annoying to deal with. You don't want to be on the other end of that, yeah. No, I think they're relobbying. So do I leave? Um, yeah, they're relobbying. Hold on, I'll get you the new link. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Um, I've so I'm kind of interested to see what they're going to pick. Me too. I mean, this is the best of three. Like, there will be adaptions to the rules as we go from game to game. Mm hmm. Like, you won't be able to pick like this that you've played before. So, you have to make some strategic choices there as well. Now, and so let's say. Some other when you say pick, does that mean neither team can pick that save or only one team can't pick that save? Uh, I think it will go for neither. Maybe I'll have a quick read through the rulebook again. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing about these tournaments is they can often have like big old complicated rules. Thank you, Owen. I appreciate you. How's it going, Karkby? I think that should be the new link. I have clicked it. Maybe it is not. It's the same link. <laughs> oh, hey, but no. people are in here. Oh, it was the same Steam link, yes, but it's like a new lobby. It was just the same profile, which is like the same. Poor effect. Yeah, other things to talk about, I guess, were because of the 130 turn, uh, 130 turn limit, like science victory isn't going to be an option usually. Yes, you would need like a god tier Russia start where you just didn't get touched for the entire game. Yeah, something like that. But that's really unlikely in multiplayer. Maybe some science CS as well that people can't kill. <laughs> it's it's a statistical improbability that you're going to get a science victory here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Culture victory can happen, but it's tough. It's tough if you're under pressure and you're fighting. Yes. Um, especially, I feel like a culture victory would be extra hard here. Um, because there's so few players in the game. So it's quite hard to actually... Um, normally a culture victory, you will have like a few people who you'll get high modifiers against that you can pull. Uh, true, true. You know what I mean? With trade routes, this kind of stuff, yeah. Whereas in a 2v2, half the players in the game, um, relatively speaking... It's kind of complicated to explain, but you know this, like where every tourist costs... 200 times the number of players in the game. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't there's know. Cool, there's cool stuff like um, sneaking in a rock band here to play on like the defending culture peer players' uh, territory and to steal their terrorists, the domestics. Ooh, that's Ooh. clever. Actually, Ice Fairy just asked a good question. What's the most common win condition? So I think take a step back and look at the Civ pool. This season, is playing with a limited pool of how many civs, guys? Is that like 20 civs, 15? I think it was 25. 25. And so you already know that multiplayer civ is played with the balance mods, just to make sure that everyone has an equal chance of winning in every part of the game. But I think what was interesting is that for this pool, what I've noticed, and maybe Corny can say more about it since he was closer to the selection, is that they've taken out some of the sieves that are super strong and going for one win con. So you'll notice Russia is not in this pool because Russia has a very strong culture victory. My, I don't think Maya is Maya in this pool. No, Maya is not in the pool because I think Maya can go for a fast space win. So what they've done is they've taken some of the sieves that don't get picked too much in four before, like your Gandhis and your Cleopatras and your Ottomans, and they don't really have a bias toward any single win con necessarily. But as the seasons progressed, I think we've all started to see certain strengths of these civs really come out. So Congo has a really strong classical unit. And, you know, Cleo's got those chariot archers like we were talking about, Nubia. So I feel like more and more what we're seeing this season, at least, is that the win condition is typically one person just dying <laughs> yes. because of uh, really strong classical units. One person dies and then the conceit is called. Yes, so I people feel like the team... Very... Sorry, I just wanted to say, people are sometimes also very stubborn and just keep playing when the game's over. <laughs> yeah, because they feel like they still have a chance. I think one thing that we've seen is that the players who are here are players who are very strong with their war moves. 
I feel like that's the skill set that gets tested. And like you said, you know, warring while simming at the same time, I think that's the skill set that we'll see today um, that the winners will need to do better than the other team. More so than a traditional like culture or space win. Yes. Mm -hmm. I like... You... Go ahead. Go ahead, sorry, sorry. You go ahead. I said go ahead first. You go. The people that are playing here, like went through like a month of this league, then made their way up the leaderboard, then fought their way to this tournament. Like they are definitely like the creme of the crop. The cream of the crop. The creme de la creme. I like that. I like that there's been a whole tournament where all these players have managed to cut their teeth. All right. Like the meta has been boiled down. Probably like the early game strategies, which unit you go for. Oh, look, dude, like we got this guy sandwiched between us. Do we all in him? But then the other guy's got the sim behind it and then he kills us. You know, there's a lot of like interesting machinations you can plan here. I'm really curious to see. The one thing I want to see here is a settler steal because, oh my God, I feel like in smaller games, getting a settler yoinked is way more likely. I mean, it's going to make for a quick game. Yes. I think I remember uh, it was a few months ago, me and Michael had set up to be like, all right, we're going to watch this like epic 1v1. And like the Zulu slipped like a scout in behind. And the dude was like sending his first or second settler to like a perfectly safe place along a river. And the scout spotted him and just yoinked it. And dude, he instant mm. CC'd. And it was so anticlimactic. You do have to select spectator, though, by the way. Oh, yep, 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 yep. I'm spectator. Doop. Thank you for reminding me. That. I really appreciate that. <clears throat> so what is the... what? Is, so in terms of, like, the metagame in the early... We'll talk about this more when we're in the game. But... In 4v4, you pick a sieve because like, oh, this is a strong trading sieve or this is a strong XYZ sieve. Mm -hmm. In this leader pool, like what have been like the standout sieves that people have been like picking early into their games? Like you want to pick a sieve that can maybe get aggressive or something that can hold their own in a classical war scenario. Mm. You also might want something that has something unique so you can actually hit a golden age because it is pretty it's tough pretty with just four people. Oh, that's true. It's quite hard to hit a golden age when there's only four people, right? Because normally mm -hmm. in a 4v4, you get a ton of free points from people exploring. Yeah, this is different here. Yeah. You will see actually, I think like 30% of the time, if you play a 2v2 and you play a sieve that doesn't have anything unique, you're going to end up playing a normal age. And sometimes you still win the game anyways, but uh, it's going to be harder for sure. Yeah, because, like, missing your classical Golden Age is brutal. Um, do people still go for, like, the three-city opener? Yeah, I mean, it's just a classic. Uh, so, out of curiosity, do people ever do, like, a two-city or a four-city opener? Is that, like, something you ever see? I think you see a two-city openers quite a lot on religious earths, where you just build a holy site and a shrine instead of the third settler. And then maybe you get two early empire and you just make two settlers after one another. That's definitely a thing. Yes. I like that. That's there's, uh there's that's a lot the, of variations. That's the classic I need to rush a religion build. That's one of my favorites. I do it all the time. Um I tried to experiment with a four city opener, but it didn't work. God, who's calling me? Seems like we can finally start the game. Based. Okay, so the way this is going to work, by the way, is that all the bands, like each team gets one ban right now, and one okay. pick, obviously. <laughs> like they have to make their own chess. But uh, okay. anything that was banned and picked in the first round won't be allowed in the second round. So, ah, so, so you're forcing it. people to go outside of their civ comfort zone. Exactly interesting so if you know like let's say i knew jj was really strong on ottomans i could ban that on round one 
Yeah, except that they didn't. <laughs> Interesting. You see this combo also of Egypt and Ottomans. It's just very, very good. You get so, like, sorry. What What's so strong about the combo? Oh, that's right. It's it's a BVG change for the Ottomans. They get a unique building is the Grand Bazaar, and it's a replacement for the banks, and it gives an extra trade capacity. So they oh. will just have twice the traders of everyone else if they make it that far into the game. And Cleopatra gives you boosts the trade routes to them. That is sick mm. as hell. It's actually kind of surprising that the other team allowed this at all to happen. Yeah, this feels like one of those combos that must have come up a few times. Yeah. But this combo is dependent on Cleopatra and Ottomans being close enough to trade, right? Otherwise, they're both doing internals the whole game. There's a lot that can still happen, and there's also counterplay that you can do, yeah. True. Whoa, what is this Pedro pick? That's interesting. It is interesting. People really like the Minas Geras. Um, I don't know if I'm actually pronouncing that right. <laughs> Um, I, a Brazilian person told me it was like Minas Gerais or something. I, I forget. I used to know how to pronounce it. So it's the, the unique battleship is the powerful thing here? Yeah. You don't have to commit coast very much. Uh, and you can still easily win it. Like you don't have to tag all the way into the top tree to get that unique unit because it is on the culture tree. And it's way stronger than any battleship or anything else that comes around the same time. The That's true, actually. I had forgotten about that the fact that it's on the culture tree completely changes the interaction with the water because you can just go hard culture and still win the sea now you do have to hard build them which kind of sucks but it also means that you could go for like a land push and this at the same time mm, that's actually really interesting i didn't really think of brazil as an incredibly strong um war sieve but um, i see that potential but uh, getting coastal control on these maps is sometimes very, very huge because you can nuke from the sea and the enemy team can't really do anything about this. Yes, because uh, he who controls the sea controls the universe. Now, interesting spawns here. The Ottomans and the Egyptians have spawned on the eastern half of the continent and then the Brazilians with Under the Gun and Nubia Task Force Fish have spawned on the western side of the continent with Task Force Fish having an insane amount of land available. Yeah, but this is also exactly what we talked about during draft, right? With the Egypt and the Suleiman being able to trade to each other. Yep, and Nubia is in the worst position ever because ideally you want Nubia to make a whole bunch of potato archers and just launch them at her neighbor, right? To force them to defend. Exactly. And she is as far away as she could be right now, which is not ideal. There is a very nice natural wonder up there to uh, to tide them over. Uh, are there any remaps in this game mode, out of curiosity? Uh, yeah, each team gets one. So I would not be surprised to see them actually remap alone on position. Interesting, interesting. Um, shall we go through and talk about these start locations? Uh, yes. We do have a BBS one there, by the way. This is something that was added by one of our developers. I've on... seen this one before, the Namib Sansi. Mm -hmm. I think it might have snuck in an accident. I mean, it doesn't seem to be a big deal. I don't think it's a big deal. It's pretty cool. I like it. It did uh, any of the BBS or BBG map natural wonders i didn't think they were overpowered or anything and i like this one too because it just makes your scouts like slightly better mm -hmm. i mean it's not entirely game breaking but they're not supposed to be here i don't think <laughs> right okay i see so there's very strict rules in a tournament game you don't want to have the special extra wonders no, really. of all the content recently sieve and non -sieve. thank you so much andrew Bodrew. for sieve 7 uh, I think we're all excited for we the potential of Civ 7. They actually force a remap over this. It will be up to the organizers. Mm. I mean, I don't think it actually make, makes the game in any shape or form different than what it would be otherwise if that was just uh, Eye of Sahara or something. Yeah, that's true. I think. I think it should be fine, right? It won't, won't change the game, will it? I don't think so. Um, I do have a couple of questions. I mean, naturally, everyone is starting with scouts, right? Nobody has started with, like, builders or anything like that. 
Yeah. I mean, you can start builder sometimes, but no one really has this spawn for it necessarily. Maybe Egypt could go for it. Get the nice stone circles, maybe. There could be a really nice stone circles in here. I think you're right. Uh, out of curiosity, out of all of these saves that you can see right now, whose spawn do you like the most? <laughs> I mean, probably just uh, the Suleiman because he spawned next to Egypt, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> True. Every single trader that he can get up and yeah. get going to his ally is going to be massive. Egypt could have a really nice game with Nathan Lanky here, maybe. There's a lot of floodplains. Ooh, so looking nice. at this, as you know, each team has one remap token and on turn 10 they'll decide whether or not they want to remap with the vote. Mm -hmm. Do you think... So I think it's clear if I were playing Egypt, if I were playing Egypt or Ottomans, I probably wouldn't remap just because we're right next to each other and this is exactly what we want. But let's look at the other team. If you look at Under the Gun and Task Force Fish with Nubia and Brazil, do you think that they would be interested in remapping this if you were playing them? Oh yeah. If I if I if I was in their position and I have the knowledge that I have right here, I would be smashing that remap button. <laughs> <laughs> there's, Why? Ways, there's ways for uh, like uh, the Brazil player to get creative to like get on the bottom C to get some of his U out, but um, this is not really what you. Like want to plan for? No, I not, agree. Not even something that they might even know at the time. I think there would be a little bit too many unknowns to do that. I mean, they have a lot of the map. They have mountains in between, but this shouldn't actually favor them, right? They don't want this kind of scenario where they're both just swimming happily away. Uh, so it looks like the remap is being called due to the, uh... Wrong preset. Yes, and that's probably to do with the natural wonders. Well... Shit host. You can use this as an opportunity to also readjust your settings for my volume, Potato. I think it's coming through too loud. Sure thing. Let me adjust you down. Scooch, can you talk again? How is this? Is this better? It's a little bit better. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring you back up just to Scooch. Talk again. Again. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go Here again. We go. <laughs> I actually just watched that music video recently. You know the one where they're like jumping on the... Uh, S the Treadmills. Wait, wait, there. Oh! The that's classic. A that's Such a, a classic. classic. Um, is the remap oh, free? I, is this a, I, I assume this is a free meme map. Meme map? A remap due to the yeah. map configuration. Someone mishosted, unfortunately, and then clicked the preset. Like it's Dude. super simple to like actually set these lobbies up, but sometimes you end up forgetting, I suppose. If I surely couldn't you distribute like a, a lobby configuration save file? Yeah, exactly. This is what the, the preset is. You just select it, your lobby is completely set up already. You can just select a save and go. Hmm. Interesting. Um what was I gonna say? It's still the same link as before, I think. <laughs> okay, perfect, perfect, perfect. Error joining multiplayer session. Or maybe it's not up yet. Do the casters expect to see nukes? I think usually the game starts to end bef by the time they get tanks, and nukes are a little bit beyond tanks. Mm. I think for like a regular multiplayer game of like 4v4 on online speed, anything before turn 110 would be good nuke timing. That would be really good nuke timing. And it does go to turn 130. There's a bit of a window there. You might get to see one. The thing about... Here's the thing, though. With 4v4, you have more people earning Eurekas. You have more people feeding you gold. Very true. So I think that's enough, I think, to delay that timing. You, I think there's a slim chance we could see nukes like on the last couple turns of a game here. Yeah. I mean, I think, if anything, we will see like one or two at the end to like get the last capital or something like this. 
I got your link, thank you. Love your content. Been a huge help to my Civ experience. Volume up, please, on Corny. Okay, let me see. <laughs> I get that a lot. It's time to buy a new headset. Are they using a set map seed for this? For this best of three? Can you... Know. Can you talk a little bit, Corny? Like, just say a sentence? Yes. I don't think they have preceded maps. I might be wrong, to be honest. Okay, so this is just whatever fate gives you. I think so. I think uh, Falcon, who is like the head of this tournament, uh, was thinking at some point about loading the maps beforehand to check whether they're like okay to play. Like you don't want to end up in a scenario where yeah, it's just you spawn and then you can't win because of the way you spawned and you also don't have any remaps left. Yeah. No, that would be one of the worst things that could happen. I think it never feels good to lose due to spawn. But I think it's quite, is it not quite rare to lose to spawn because you do have those remap tokens? Ah, there's still a lot of it, to be honest. Mm. Like, you, people like to blame it a lot more than what is actually, like, actually true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to say, ah, oh, this is just, nah, we lost on spawn, whatever, guys. But uh, it does still happen. Yes, and this is already looking like a kind of more interesting spawn in some respects. Like we've got Brazil over here in the north, Egypt nearby, the Ottomans are down the south in the middle, and then Nubia again over here on the west kind of isolated. But although that will give them unprecedented control over these city-states. Interesting map with this huge top sea. This might actually be exactly what you're looking for if you're playing Brazil in particular. But, I mean, can you use this sea? I guess you can use it against the Ottomans. Like, if you get a couple of Minas Gerais over here, you just have, like, total control over this choke. Exactly. It could be interesting. Um, I would love to see them play this map. Ooh, very powerful natural wonder over here. I'm excited to see if anyone uh, goes for that. So good. Are you looking for some tile pawn with some Petra? Absolutely. Maybe pyramids as well. Petra, pyramids. Get a preserve in there, man. You could do it all. <laughs> I would be surprised if we see a preserve, but maybe. Maybe. You can Listen. Work. Who's Brazil? I'm going to. Someone, <laughs> someone DM JJ and tell him he needs to build a preserve. Wait, no, wait. Don't, don't tell him that. That's actually secret info. Never mind. Don't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you got the wrong guy, though. But yeah. Oh, yeah. Do <laughs> yeah, send it to JJ. He'll have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Let's So let's take a peek at the starting locations. You've got Nubia here, uh, far left of the map. It looks like a pretty interesting starting location. They've got a nice lake. They've got a nice 2-2 base tile with a few 2-2 hills. That's obviously thanks to the Better Balance Start mod giving them a good spot. What do you guys think mm -hmm. of Nubia Start? Mm, I mean, you can see, like, this lake is like three tiles wide. You could settle on the other side and open it up to the big sea. That could be a big play. Right. And that would allow trade, potentially ships, all that stuff? Exactly. Mm. Otherwise, there's not really much to go for, particularly easily in district-wise. Might just be, like, commercial opening. I have an opening even. Right. Well, the game has officially started, so turns will start going by really quickly here. So what do you think about Brazil's start location? They're off coast, but they do have 1-3 tiles and 2-2 two, two tiles and a 3-1 base. Looking like a pretty okay start. God spawns for everyone. Yes. <laughs> this is what the mod does. Everyone gets something playable. Very, very nice. Plus one population tribal hut picked up for uh, Brazil here, actually. Potentially a nice, strong start for them. What about Egypt? 
Ooh, their start doesn't look quite as strong out the gate. I mean, they still have the 3-1 and the 1-3 the and the 2-2s, two but I feel like they have a, a lot less hills compared to other people in their first ring. Yeah, but you want to build it in Nanki, right? Get that city up, all those flat plains. It's Can true. Good. It's true. I If we see an Edmund Nanki here, I'd be very, very happy. It would be a very, very nice day. How about our good friend, the Ottomans, right? So they have spawned in a pretty interesting location. Looks like they're on a flat tile too with their 3-1 base. And they've got a nice deer tile and a nice sheep tile. But again, I'd say actually, if I was to compare these two teams, I feel like Brazil and Nubia, I feel like they got higher quality spawns. Like just in terms of like total t number of 2-2 two -two tiles. Okay, yeah, sure. But um, this is another map where the, uh, the <coughs> sorry, the Suleiman and the Egypt will be able to trade. But Brazil might have an opportunity to disrupt that. Uh, Noob634 just found a relic. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, dude. I guess it's no remap from that team. You know what, Rigged. though? If I, if I could put some money on it, I would say... If I'm Task Force Fish playing Nubia right now, I've picked this sieve. I want to do some damage with my Nubian archers. If by turn 10, I haven't met anyone I can do damage to, I'm probably pro remap. Look at him. Look at him with this three scouts. He's out for blood. <laughs> he is out for blood. My God. Unfortunately, two of those scouts are going the wrong way. And the warrior is inching his way towards Turkey. But will he find him in time before he decides to remap? Do you think this is too far away to really mount an assault or if he does find Turkey, do you think he would make the assault anyway? Well, I know Fish, and I know that there's no such thing as too far away for Task Force Fish. He will march his units across the map to mess up your game. <laughs> 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 He's good at it too, but I think if he doesn't... Well, I guess they will meet before turn 10, but I think he might still want to remap because the Ottomans is pretty far. You know, this kind of dis distance can also often work to your advantage, I guess disadvantage, depending on whose side you're on. Because you you might think, if you're Suleiman here, this guy is very far away, I will just open commercials and then get surprised if the attack does come. Ooh, that's true. You could get caught with your, your commercial hubs down. <laughs> exactly. First settler popping out here for Brazil. Looks like they are first to the punch, getting their settler out just a turn before everyone else. And here's the thing about competitive sieve. A single turn is more than enough to make a difference. But he does have a warrior menacing outside of his city, which is making me a little bit scared for the settler because I imagine he probably wants to forward settle Egypt to make this land more difficult to control, right? Yeah. I mean, he might be scared of the unique unit of Egypt, but he also wants to get there to, like in between them to disrupt yep. them and you want to deny them to forward settle you that as well control the land so what do your instincts say instincts say a remap here my mind's on a yes from task force fish yeah we might see it from their team I don't think the Egypt team is too upset with their spawns especially with the relic players Ooh. in red voted against Ooh. All right, I'll add this to the check that's in the mail, Potato. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So talk me through that. Why might they have voted against it when your instinct was saying that they were going to do it? Hmm. I mean, it's possible that Fish took a look at this and thought, you know, Alpha's not so far away from Istanbul. Mm -hmm. We've got our three movement archers. We can do this. And he's headed in that direction for sure. What they really want to avoid is this east versus west of the last map, right? This is not that. So they might have thought that this is just good enough. We can play this. Yeah, this is playable. And I think someone just put down the first campus. Yeah, it looks like it was Brazil. And it's quite a good one. Not the best, um, but playable. There's a way to see the adjacency on this, I think. I think if you hover it. Just hover over the campus Ah, itself. yeah, it's a plus three. I would say a plus three, and that's like baseline really, really good. Oh, the scout over here getting lit up. <laughs> and Egypt settling there as well. In the middle of the first fire. That's a little scary. 
I'm noticing like way more units on the map than I would normally expect and Egypt moves to stand on the campus. I wonder, has Brazil actually spotted this natural wonder up here? It looks like he has. Do you think he would settle this or is he going to settle the truffles? An early amenity is nice. I don't know. It does prevent amenity um, starvation. And just settling faster might be what you're looking for. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He's going for the geothermal, actually. Plus one science. I mean, with the campus and the geothermal, it seems like he's very focused on science, which kind of screams to me he hadn't appeared, but you know. Well, you might be surprised because the way that this option is set up now for this tournament is the no RNG option on the city centers. So actually every single time, no matter what is on it, will either be a 3-1 or a 2-2. Two -two. Oh, so settling on luxuries isn't as strong anymore. I mean, you still get the lux, right? Like this is but you don't good. get... You don't get you the don't, free gold. Exactly. Or you don't get mm. the science from the Geo, which is very controversial, to be honest. Like, this was yeah. very much an experiment of how it would play out. I think, I think I'm on team undo that change, personally. I like it. <laughs> I like to get those extra yields when you settle on a luxury. Me too. Yeah, it splits the community. As it should, okay? Because one, <laughs> one side is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> This is interesting. So let's have a look at the techs. Egypt has gone straight for wheel. I think he's probably loaded in and clicked wheel. He's going to have Marianus in two turns or start building them in two turns. But under the gun has decided, Brazil has decided to go for campuses first, which means he's a little behind. Ooh, yeah, that's true. Very scary for the Brazil player. It is interesting, though, that the Egypt didn't go for craftsmanship to get the card to actually make the EU, right? They went for early empire, if I'm seeing this correctly. Yeah, they are actually going for early empire. I feel like you would go craftsmanship here, surely. Me too. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, there's no way to tech check people's tech trees. Hey, Civ developers, please implement that. You might think. Oh, wait, you can check the tech tree now. You click on, on the Egypt icon and then you can click on the tree. Uh, it just shows it as blank. Oh, I swear this used to be a feature. Maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe I'm just doing it wrong. No, I don't think so. This is how I would have done it as well. I don't know. Egypt does have mon monuments coming up, and this is to rush for what? You just want to get your government out? I mean, maybe the choice to go early empire first is because he thinks he will have enough culture to actually get craftsmanship soon enough with these monuments. Mm. When he actually wants to build the EU, he maybe wants to take a time, make a trader as well, make a builder, start shopping. It is better to get your governor fast. Soon yeah. Once. Especially because Brazil went for camp. I like, he's got to know Brazil went campuses first, right? Which means his arches are going to be slightly delayed. Mm -hmm. So there's that consideration as well. Brazil being incredibly scared as well right now with all these units. Is this the appropriate way to play though? Like very, very defensively, carefully... He might be playing defensively at the wrong time because it's not right now that is actually scary. It's going to be scary later. Like you wanna sift sometimes is usually like a like a dance of how much can I greet, right? How much what can I get away with? Yes. This is something I talk talk about actually sometimes is like uh, how few warriors can I build? Exactly, exactly. Um but let's let's check in on Nubia. Uh, the potato archers are out. There are three out. Two more in production. We've got a monument coming as well. Yeah, Cynthia was right. <laughs> uh, and it looks like there are no monuments in these cities, with the exception of Faras here on the left side. We've already got salt online. We've got horses up. We could see some horsemen follow up. Mm. In fact, he is going for horseback riding. So we are going to see horsemen. You see what he is also going for in the culture tree. What is that? Military tradition. This is something you would probably never do in a single player game. At all. Ever. 
but uh, going straight for craftsmanship oh, into position is like oh, the fastest way to do a rush like this with horses, with archers. Yes, because you, you, you usually you would skip military tradition unless it's like a super early war and you need the support and flanking bonuses. Yeah, it also gives you the card for making horses. Yes. Of course. Um, we do see, we did see he did get his horses up super early on Nubia. Yeah, he got them up omega early. What were you going to say, Synth? Can we, okay, let's put ourselves in JJJ's shoes right now. You are the Ottomans. You don't know that there are three Nubian archers and a couple of scouts coming toward you. Is he ready, actually? Does this work? No, he's not ready at all. Um, I mean, I would be looking at my 50 military score and then Nubia is 165 and I'd be like, mm -hmm. I need to make archers right now. <laughs> But he's not. I mean, he's making one in Istanbul, but it's going to take three turns for it to pop. And in those three turns, those Nubian archers are going to be descending upon him. <laughs> I think he will switch off this monument in the next couple of turns, realizing that it was a mistake. <laughs> oh. oh. Maybe right now. No, Fish gave it up. There it is. Fish did reveal his hand, perhaps slightly too early, attacking with that patati archer so. onto a scout. I maybe would have waited a turn or two. I don't know. Me too. But Me here's too. the thing. Maybe Fish is assuming that the Ottomans is expecting the patati archer push and is already pre-building archer, so he's thinking, I need to get in and do damage now. I agree. I mean, you should, if you're in this tournament, you should respect your opponents enough to see, to expect them to see that this is coming and to prepare properly. So you do just want to get as much damage in as possible, maybe. For sure. I really do think Potato would be a top tier multiplayer player if he ever wanted to do that. <laughs> it's it's on the list of things that I want to get around to. <laughs> and it will stay on that list forever. <laughs> what, what else is on that list? Uh, how much time have you got? <laughs> There's about 500 things on that list. I've got like 40 videos that are half written and half recorded. Yeah getting really good at this either you have affinity for it already or you just like treat it as a full-time job like surf is so incredibly complicated there's new stuff that you learn like every day if you play oh this. for sure i think if i play i i reckon if i played enough multiplayer i could probably get into like maybe the top 10 top five percent of players like in like four to six months maybe i think i can i think i'm capable because here's the thing the average player is pretty bad I think you, you can get better than the average player pretty quick. Yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> I mean, well, some there are people... a lot of things that you just need to learn. Like, just things, you know, it's not necessarily skill-based stuff, but just knowledge that you have. Yeah, that's yeah. why I said four to six months, because there's a lot of learning. I'm talking about, like, if I did it full-time, eight hours a day. Yeah, I think that's about right, Potato. <laughs> 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 We've got, uh, listen... Oh, me and me and Corny were actually talking about maybe we could do like a we could cast like a newbie um two v two tournament, right? Where the only requirements to sign up for the tournament are that you've never played a CPL game. And uh, we just we cast a whole bunch of like bronze league two v twos. I mean there's plenty of that in other games. I could think it could be really fun. Yeah, I think it'd be really fun. I'm working on my Smurf name right now. <laughs> <laughs> but it's surprising how big the multiplayer community is. And also, I don't know if you guys have ever checked like the Steam charts for Civ 6, but the game just seems to grow and only yes. grow. It's insane. Well, it's and so it's, what, what's thing. exciting to me is just how many women there are that are interested in Civ. Because it's not like a Dota or, ooh, look at this. Look at this. Disaster. Uh, we were talking about base trades earlier in StarCraft. We might get to see one ourselves right here. I think we might. Ooh, this is uh, this is very scary for the Ottoman player because he is just gone. To be honest, but at yep. the same time, Brazil is also in huge, huge trouble. Very soon, the Marianu chariot archers are out. The Marianu. Mm -hmm. Magnus is established. We're going to be chopping very soon. Yep, we've got builders in position. The chops are happening. Also, you've got an absolute amazing coffee tile here. Three food, three production, and a, and a culture on it. Oh, maybe we should check Pantheons, by the way. 
Sure thing. Uh, let's have a look at Aegis Pantheon is initiation rights. Interesting. So initiation rights gives you 35% of a non-civilian land units production in faith when produced. Interesting. So producing military gives you faith. That seems like it's quite a good one for 2v2s. Yeah, it's like something very akin to God of the Forge. Slightly used differently. You don't get to pick like Panbrush, for example. You have to pick Monumentality if you want to start shopping. But yeah, it's made, I think, more interesting than the base game variation of it. And that is the only pantheon in the game right now. And I agree. I think it's way more interesting than the base game. I like the idea of getting resources for building units. Brazil, going for the Temple of Artemis. Uh, this seems greedy. Is yeah. he maybe thinking this is just really <laughs> far away from the front line and it, there's no point? Oh, what's interesting happening. is that he's doing it for three resources. He's got a, a one truffle, one sheep pasture, and then the potential for another fourth ring sheep pasture for his next city <laughs> i think he's just thinking about housing and the food from it more than the amenities but yeah it's interesting that he's going for this while he's like basically fighting right from the get-go is he doing it for golden how does that look for everyone i oh, think Carol said that asked earlier uh we've got two turns on a golden age and everyone has hit it except for the ottomans what is he going to do about that golden age he might actually prefer to stay in it because he does get the plus four against other civilizations in the normal ages. And he doesn't know, obviously, is that Nubia got it, of course. Guys, look at this. Look at this Nubian invasion. This is impressive. <laughs> I told you, there's no distance that's too far for Task Force Fish. And this exactly. Is <laughs> Especially also... with those archers with the extra movement. Yeah. The surprise factor is always there as well. Oh, he's going to take the city with a scout. Oh. Miscalculation. Oh. He moved too quick. Oh. Now he actually doesn't have anything to take the city with. <laughs> he has He has nothing. The city is safe. I don't believe it. There's nothing coming either. Unbelievable. <laughs> That is oh, a no. moment right there. That feels bad. Add that to the clips channel. God, ooh. How, so <laughs> imagine you are a Nubia right now. What's going through your head? How angry are you at yourself? Way too much. <laughs> <laughs> because here's the thing. I'm pretty sure the Ottomans were dead from this push if that goes through. But this gives I the Ottomans it. like a super good window to come back now. I mean, that was the game-winning play right there, if it had been a, if he had pulled it off. Very true. I mean, game state wise this is still entirely fine. Ottomans will miss the Golden Age. They still have to fight a bunch of archers with archers. Well, he has, like, not the upper hand against the Nubian archers, of course. And Task Force Fish on Nubia is building two more settlers. Uh, what happened to all the Marianu chariot archers over here for I, Egypt? I Thieves. don't know either. Holy shit. <laughs> Thebes is about to crumble. Um, uh, I think... I changed my mind. I think Nubia and Brazil are in an incredibly dominant position right now. This is insane. <laughs> oh, he gets it. Now, do you raise oh, here or do you keep? Oh, that is so unlucky. It's the, He didn't even swap the coffee, guys. <laughs> no. Oh, no, he didn't swap it. Oh, It's an absolute really disaster. <laughs> the early plus three campus got him to horseback so much faster than Egypt got to classical themselves. They had their UU, of course, but that doesn't increase city strength. And they went for four cities as well. Kind of yeah. disrespecting. That's what I was saying earlier. Like a four city opener feels very greedy if you like get attacked. Yeah. Everything from Brazil just lined up for exactly this play. Like he was kind of screwed in every other scenario, but he took his one chance and he made it work. That is the devastating. That, the choices that Egypt made allowed this to happen as well. It's very interesting to see how both front lines have kind of flipped back the way that we, we thought they would go. We thought Egypt would be the dominant power over here, taking out a Brazil. But Brazil is the one currently on the offensive. And similarly, we thought that Nubia would be the one killing the Ottomans. But the Ottomans are holding 
off. So things have like completely flipped at how you expect them. That is awesome. <laughs> I definitely did not expect things to turn out this way. Me neither, to be honest. Like this game seems very chaotic overall. Still so much chopping, but I don't think you can make a big enough carpet of Mariani chariot archers to uh, to keep this going. Looks like we've got an encampment coming out here from Rio de Janeiro as well. So could be seeing some great generals soon. Um, I mean, the... Interesting enough, like, uh, Egypt will have the same problem as Nubia. Like they have all these range shields, but even if they shoot the city down, they have nothing to take it with. That's true. You do need to have a unit that attacks in melee in order to actually capture a city. Horsemen going down here and major experience going. What's the current like simming yields? Yeah, looks like everyone's about the same. Brazil obviously doing the better, the best, because he managed to yoink that coffee tile that's obviously carrying him right now. <laughs> yeah, but look at Egypt. Like the faith from initiation rights, he actually managed to buy another settler with this. He's going to settle. He's going to get more chops again from that. That he can find, like buy a builder for with faith. Yep, and don't forget, every time one of these chariot archers comes out, he's getting even more faith to be able to buy more builders exactly, and just consistently. Exactly. Uh, this is actually I really like this initiation rights build. The early like faith economy, if you can get that golden age, is kind of blowing my mind right now. Yeah. And it's a multiplayer thing, right? Because in single player, I feel like you very rarely spam this many units in class. Yes. I really like early war. I think it's a lot of fun, but the problem is in single player, you, you're, you know, the AI gets so many bonuses early. Early war is a bit of a gamble depending on how close you are. Well, and I feel like war against AI just is not as fun as war against real people. That's true. That's true. Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> I, w I would agree. Either they just have like so many bonuses where it's not fun anymore, right? Or they just are like Prince AI and they just are bad at decision making. Yeah. So the Ottomans actually took God of the Forge. Which gives you a 30% production boost towards ancient and classical military units, which is a very nice boost. So very clearly he's ready to defend himself. Although do you, if you're in the Ottomans shoes right now, do you feel very secure? You've got a decent sized army. You've already repelled the initial push. What's going through your mind? Well, you did clear out a lot of these potato archers, but now you're in this position where you don't have a golden age, you are behind in city count, and maybe you see yourself forced to make a play yourself now on Nubia to catch up again. Mm, the lack of a golden age really hurting him here. I mean, he is holding steady on science and culture. In fact, he is top culture in this game, but he is bottom science by a smidge. Yeah, you can see he went Moksha this game, right? Like Moksha in this mode gets the culture promotion per pop. Um, everyone else kind of opened with a Magnus for all their shops, I think. Yep, looks like I'm seeing a Magnus over here on Nubia. Uh, actually, Brazil also went Moksha first, and Egypt went Magnus into Moksha. Yeah, fair enough. Pretty standard stuff. Yeah, don't count Egypt out yet. Look how the, the battle has turned once again. Look how many Mariano is there. Look how little units there from Brazil. That's true. I mean, the thing is, early war can swing back and forth very quickly. So what do you think is um, Brazil's follow-up now to try and get out of, or, or, or to try and retake the tempo? I mean, the only way to fight these Marianos really is either if you get to, like, knights or courses, which is very far away, but uh, crossbows are, like... Uh, much closer solution. Mm, so you spam out a few archers. He's projecting for, looks like he's projecting for a great general right now, hoping that that'll help him a little bit. But the damage on these archers is going to get insane, especially if they start getting promoted. I'm starting to see like there's two promoted archers over here. There's a few without experience. This guy's almost promoted. This guy's almost like, and he's going for the plus five range strength against the units. So these guys are hitting almost like crossbows right now. They got 40 combat strength. These chariots are insane, yes. dude. The reason I say that crossbows are closer than knights and courses, by the way, is not because of the science necessarily, but for like the, the policy card for them. Because you do need divine right to actually make a cavalry. Meanwhile, yes. you need just feudalism to actually spam crossbows out. 
That's right. And you want to get feudalism anyway because you want that plus two builder charge. Like so feudalism is just in in my mind, um feudalism feudalism is the civic that like defines how good your game is going. Like how quickly you get feudalism mm -hmm. is just like it's everything. A lot of these games otherwise uh, end up though with uh, you going silver first, obviously, for that plus five from the military lines. Mmm, interesting. That's actually a completely different build order but it makes total sense right because you want to get that military yes. alliance like there's always like a choice do i want like stronger units or do i want to start making like something like a crossbow now already or if you're playing like japan for example and get a samurai at feudalism then you might want to go for that instead <clears throat> over civil yes uh, looks like walls are coming up I think Brazil is slightly worried. He's getting walls in Rio. He has an encampment, so that'll be two shots. So they'll have to fight their way through two districts. This swordsman seems to be doing a little bit of work. He has a promotion. Probably go Tortoise here to keep him safe. Um, and the archers are gently pushing back. But this chariot swarm is insane. <laughs> the walls will be nice, but they're going to get shot down as well. I mean, it'll buy him more time at least. Exactly. I mean, this is really all he needs, right? More time. They will boost some engineering as well. He will have crossbows very quickly, actually. Yes, so he's boosting engineering by building ancient walls, and he has three archers, so he should have crossbows in the next, what, like, 15 turns? I think he's thinking about standard speed. I think he will be there much quicker. Hmm. Maybe, maybe. We'll see. We will see. My instincts might be off here. Um, but it looks like Nubia uh, seems to be simming. I see builders in queue. I see districts in queue. And a wall, a front line of archers has developed here. And the Ottomans also building their own front line of archers while they continue to sim. Two new settlers popping out for the Ottomans. They've obviously got Moksha established. Looks like they're planning to try to take this breather and make use of it. Although Nubia is still trying to be a little bit aggressive, getting the occasional kill. But the Ottoman player, extremely quick at the fireback. Yes. Well, what's nice about what Nubia is doing right here is they're claiming this land. They're saying, look, this half of the map, this is mine. So Ottomans has nowhere to go but back into the land of his ally. Very true. But he also does want to settle towards Egypt. It's not necessarily that bad of a thing, but the land doesn't look that great, to be honest. No, it doesn't. He's got a nice forest fire. Mm-hmm. This is not a game where we will see nukes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think, I don't think we're going to be seeing many nukes in this game. Uh, someone said in chat, turn 40 Ottoman currency. Uh, what relevance is that? Does Ottoman usually get currency a lot sooner? I mean, if you want to go for a commercial opening, you kind of want to go for it straight away. If you go for mm. horseback and all these other attacks first, like commercials will take so long to build actually. That's true. Yes. You do have to build them at some point, I guess. Yeah, but I think this is just a function of having to defend, right? You, you're kind of forced into a bad position. I'm starting to show a little bit in the mm -hmm. sim, in the sim scores, right? We're seeing only about 30, 35 production for JJ and Noob, whereas Task 4 and Under have over 50 each. Yeah, this is something that they have going for them. Even though, like, I guess, yeah, it makes sense after they lost the city with the first fire, right? But they're about yep. to take it back, kind of. Well, they're working on it. I think they can get this back. They do have a horseman in position. They've got a ton of archers. I am a little bit concerned that these horsemen are just, like, super good at doing damage to these chariot archers. Like, a single horseman hit, even in ideal terrain, can do nearly half a chariot's health. Yeah. Like, the terrain isn't great for the Marianos, honestly. It's a lot of hills, it's a lot of features. No, it's the total opposite of what you want with chariots, because chariots are faster on flatland. Mm -hmm. But Let's he's see. making it work with sheer mass alone. The Temple of Artemis is finished here in Priscilla, so this has this thing is going to grow incredibly quickly. And the we have an encampment. Any new wonders? No, it looks like the only wonder, I think, in the game is the TOA. I guess 
we might see each a bit the Timilanki yet, but I think he's busy with other things. Yeah, I think the um the mar- the chariot archer spam is just so important. And this is kind of what you want to do with Egypt anyway, right? Because you want to get the faith from building these units, put pressure on your enemy, and then use the faith from building units to settle and get builders. Very true. So his game plan makes total sense. Do you think we could see maybe some city-state kills here? Like, oh, let's ch- ch- take a look at the city-state situation. So Noob mm-hmm. is actually in control of Lahore. Ooh, could we see? Could we see that some Lehang? That is really smart. What? What was smart? Sorry. Susan Lahore because he's banking on those units helping him out a little bit. Mm, the the Nihang. Much of a help right now, but yeah, eventually. Mm-hmm. And he can purchase knee hangs with his faith from initiation rights, right? <laughs> That's quite a while away, but yes. Wait, you, he can't purchase knee hangs now? I mean, uh, they scale off the encampment building, right? Like oh, you true. You want to get a barracks up, yeah. He doesn't have an encampment even. Like, if he bought them right now, I don't even know what they would be. Like I think they're 25 base, which is kind of yeah. cringe. Essentially a warrior. Not really worth spending the faith when you can be buying builders, probably. God, this city is still somehow clinging to life. It's, it's getting even stronger. stronger. Yeah. You really get the full showcase of the initiation rights in this mod, though, here. Like, it's like something you have to commit to, really, for it to be worth it. Just like a snowball system, you build units, you five by builder, you chop, you buy more builder. And if you ever stop, it stops being worth it. I'd say so far, the, the Egypt team was, they were sort of, they had a slow start. They were caught off guard. You know, Brazil had those horses so early. Those Nubian archers were such a surprise. They popped out of nowhere. But we're seeing the tide turn now. I'm looking at the size of, of Egypt's army, and this seems pretty impressive. They are up to over nearly 400 military score, actually, and the city, and the city. Oh, almost traded it back there. Ooh. Ooh. And the rays. So was that a was that a tactical trade two horsemen to deny the city? <clears throat> For sure. Like now Egypt will have to resettle it if they want to. It was actually really, really good that they got that off. Because that buys him a lot more time, right? I mean, a horseman, Mm -hmm. two horsemen is probably worth way less than that city. I think if you did a mid-game interview right now, there's not a single player who would feel good about their game. (laughs) No, this has been an incredibly scrappy game so far. And I love how 2v2 is so intense. Because I feel like a lot of the time in 4v4, there's a lot of like, you know, dancing and flirting and no one really commits to a fight. But we've just seen these teams like <laughs> like slugging it out from minute one. Well, what's funny is that, you know, even though these two players, these four players are really all in such a slog, there's no clear winner yet. So they just have to keep playing this out. The entire game kind of depends on like your war moves, which is like very scary for someone who's like never really fought before, I guess. Yes, but if you you know if you're playing against someone of a similar skill level, you always get the opportunity to practice and learn. And the cool exactly. thing is, if you're a social person, jump on the CPL Discord, say hi, make a friend with an experienced player. Most of the people who are experienced players, they love talking to new people. They love teaching new people the game. So there's no there's no there's there's plenty of paths to learn how to play multiplayer Civ, especially war. I think that's been like pretty much every person's experience in CPL. You just you start playing, you start asking questions, you make some friends by kind of being coached a little bit. That's the most by important also part. Just playing with people that you like, yeah? Yeah, it's the most important part of the internet, guys. The internet was here to create new friendships, not to replace your friendships, okay? So get out there and make some friends. Mm-hmm. I'm better at giving advice than following it. <laughs> <laughs> So it looks like Warlord's Throne is coming out for Istanbul. Is this just like 2v2 standard or is he actually looking to go for the throat here? 
I mean, this is not an ancestral hall game, is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think it is. But man, this wave of horsemen coming out on this poor little troop of potato archers, they're looking a little... Uh... They might have overstayed the welcome. Yeah. Oh my god, he moved three units instantly. Did you see that? Maybe we can talk about shift entering. Yeah, this is oh. what you do. You set up all your moves at like the end of the turn. And then while the turn is rolling over, you just hit shift and you hit enter. And then all the moves that you've queued up will actually execute before someone else can move. That is insane. Now, what happens if everyone does shift enter at the exact same time? Do it you does just ping on pin again? I'm ping again then to the host. Sadly, like there's a lot of this where it's like slot order or depends on what your connection is like or what kind of PC you have interesting so oh, what do you mean hold on hold on you mean uh if everyone literally in the game hits it yes uh, the, is the turn skipped yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> i love this, that this happens a lot in one v ones yeah falcon save there is falcon one of the admins for the tournament he's running the tournament yes falcon ran, runs the tournament yeah he was saying it's the strategy in duels hey falcon how's it going <laughs> Um, I was going to ask a question here and I've completely forgotten what the hell I was going to ask. Um, oh yeah, yeah, well, sorry. Why why in 1v1s is it the meta? Like, is it to force your enemy to skip a turn? I mean, sometimes you shift enter a hut and they shift enter the hut and then you both shift enter the hut and then the turn just skips. <laughs> it just happens. Are you, are you guys enjoying this Classical War Fiesta? I am definitely enjoying this Classical War Fiesta. I don't think I've ever seen this many units this early into a Civ game in my entire life. How do you guys feel? I mean, I've been watching some Tivitas. <laughs> <laughs> I play on a team with both Noob634 and Task Force Fish, so I've actually seen this more times than I would like to admit. <laughs> I think I think Noob really loves doing the classical all ins. I think we're just gonna see him building Marianus for the rest of the game until his opponent is dead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he does not seem to be building anything else. I'd imagine if I could click on these cities, the entire construction queue would just be Marianus chariot archers. I think you'd be right. <laughs> I think uh, Noob is a man of commitment. He will either maybe sim the entire game, or he will do like an all in like this. You hear that, ladies? Noob is a man of commitment. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was a slightly awkward joke, my bad. Anyway. No, it was, it was, <laughs> no, it was perfect. It actually, actually reminded me of something else. I So I've been lurking on the on the Civ Reddit threads, both our Civ and our Civ 6. And what I've noticed is that there are actually a lot of women playing Civ. There Maybe is less than multiplayer, but I, I hear some women playing with their boyfriends and also some women who just roll up on their own because they're fans of strategy games. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. I have met and talked to a lot of people who play Civ that are women. Like um, a lot of, I think a lot of um, history majors <laughs> play Civ <laughs> for obvious reasons. That's, I like that. <laughs> You did have the uh, all woman tournament thing last year as well, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that was how I got into Civ is because I watched a CWC stream and Jessica, who is now Fish's wife, was streaming. And I, up until that point, I had never imagined that I would download Discord and start talking to people and playing video games with people online. But I think it was one of those things where you just had to see someone do it to realize it's a possibility. And Falcon said it, they you had a 2v2 tournament for exclusively women. Sorry, am I interrupting? No, no, no. no, no, no. I mean, this is something that might be something we do in the future, if it is possible. Uh, we've got a message here in chat, Mastro Teku. The tide is changing. One day women will choose their husband based on civ ability. <laughs> I'm okay with this world. Um, <laughs> So we've got a Warlord's Throne coming out for Brazil. He has Victor established in Salvador. Do you think this city is defendable? I mean, he does get crossbows pretty soon. Isn't that right? Uh, yes, he is on apprenticeship. 
Does he have crossbows? He's yeah, he's building them. He's making them already. Yeah, I think with Victor, with the walls, with the crossbow, pretty doable to hold on. But you do have to think about like what's your plan long term, right? You can't just defend forever. This is not how you win a game. No, you got to think about like defending is about staying alive, and then usually staying alive has to build to something else. Um, if you had to pick between Brazil's position and Nubia's, or sorry, and Egypt's position. Uh, who would you rather be right now? I think I look at all these Egypt units and I think I would <clears> rather be them. It is costing them probably a lot to have these if he doesn't have water thrown yet. Which does reduce uh, the, the maintenance of units by one as well. He does not have warlords thrown, but he, he probably does have the cost carded. Are Mariani's, are they two? Mm, I'm not sure. I think so. Uh, no, they're only base cost one. You just need the, the civic card to make them free. So he doesn't need Warlord's oh, okay, Throne. Okay. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. That's true. That's why it's such a good Civ. Although Malru's in chat brought up a good point. He thinks that e e e or the Brazil actually has a much better economy. I don't know if that's entirely <laughs> see, true, though. He's got negative <laughs> four GPT. <laughs> He does have higher stats, so he's if he can hold getting, and he has more fraud and more food. Mm -hmm. He's getting water thrown as well, though. Like, the, the minus four will soon resolve itself. <laughs> Here's the thing, though. It's a 400 combat strength deficit that he has to overcome. Exactly. He may have better stats, but can they carry him for long enough? It's also the difference of 400 combat strength of melee units or ranged units. Like these can just keep shooting you down forever. Even if you like have a couple nights, they will die. <laughs> yep. As the Brazilian, he is role playing pretty good. <laughs> the Egyptian invasion. Uh. <laughs> this is actually a reenactment of history, by the way. <laughs> and the Brazilian, a statement on the Brazilian economy. <laughs> <laughs> So if you're Brazil, here's a pop quiz. Don't go over to the tech screen just yet. But what would you be teching right now if you're Brazil? If I was Brazil right now, let me look at the tech tree. So I know he has crossbows. Um, ooh. That is a hard question. I would maybe rush cavalry. <laughs> I would just click on cavalry and close my eyes and pray. <laughs> and pray. <laughs> what do you think? Let me present you with a couple of options. You could go for printing, giving all your units plus three, and try to battle these uh, Marianos out with crossbows, right? You could go for men at arms, which in the mod is actually at military tactics, I believe it's called, to maybe get mm -hmm. like the Tortoise promotion, and then you can actually maybe slowly push your way through. It's true, you have a lot of swordsmen. That would make sense to so just upgrade them with your minus four gold per turn. <laughs> <laughs> or you could maybe try to get some cavalry up, like some curses, and try to like make a flank through the top, take some out there, retreat, do it again. That's true. Oh dear, we're starting to see uh, some galleys from the Ottoman player as well. Uh oh, that might actually be trouble. That could be a big problem for Brazil. Um, so we're seeing mass swordsmen from the Ottoman player. Is this a setup for Janissaries? Well, that Sif doesn't actually have Janissaries, so I don't think so. <laughs> oh. Oh, he's, what the hell? He's playing, he's playing, he's playing crappy Ottomans. <laughs> oh, that's right. He's playing the, the economic ones that have a bonus combat strength and stuff in different ages. He doesn't even get the Ibrahim. Oh yeah, he doesn't get the governor either. Wow. So what are the are these swordsmen just like hold the line units then? I think so. I mean, he can do the same. He can go for men at arms and that stuff. It's actually pretty strong. But uh, he is deciding for crossbows, it seems. In terms of great people, it looks like is Nubia projecting to get James of Saint George. Is this for Era Score? <laughs> is it actually already the second golden age? Um, he's already he at it. it. Interesting. 
So why would he be projecting for James to St. George? What a... Maybe he wants to do a forward city. Ooh. Plop that guy. That's an interesting idea. We do see a bunch of harbors coming up for Nubia. It looks like they're willing to get their trade up now. That would actually be a huge economic upgrade because at this point in the game, um, the cost to upgrade your units is getting really high and the tech is going to, it's going to become prohibitively expensive without these trade routes. That's true. It's an interesting boat play from JJJ. You can see those Ottoman galleys are swimming toward Brasilia. But Brazil, yeah, it's actually making Galley itself. I think it might just be for Golden Age, but he's gonna find out a whole nother surprise. Mm. So Noob is currently in a Dark Age. Do we think he can hit the Golden here? Mm, I mean, he might actually prefer to stay in the Dark Age. There oh, could he get the Twilight Valor? Himself. Yeah, I mean, it works on all media units. He doesn't really have any of those right now. But uh, Golden Age will be there for a while. Well, so wait, He's... why would he want a Dark Age then? I mean, compared to all the investment it would take him to get to the Golden Age, he might prefer it. He could go for a Heroic Age to the next age. He will have a lot of faith still from uh, his initiation rights for the Golden Age in the third one. He might want it for the traders, but he probably gets up by then. Interesting. Uh, by the way, we have a Pantheon update. Brazil went for stone circles, which I believe is plus one faith on quarries. And one production with the mod. Ah. Like, um, craftsman, basically the same. Very, very nice. And did Nubia end up ever getting one? Got a craftsman, so that's better strategic resources, which totally makes sense considering the number of strategic resources that Nubia has online. I'm counting one, two, three, four at least on screen that I can see easily. Mm -hmm. And Nubia now has shoved back towards the Ottomans. We're seeing a lot of back and forth here. Like at one point I saw Nubia pushed all the way back here to this, this is line of rice tiles. But now they're really threatening. So these Ottoman swordsmen make a lot more sense now that I'm seeing this huge push. Mm -hmm. I do love Task Force Fish's commitment to this. And this time he brought melee units as well. <laughs> but uh, yes, but he's just been here harassing poor, the, the poor citizens of Edirn. The whole game. Is that how you pronounce it? Does anyone know how to pronounce that city name? I think it's Adern. Yeah, I think it's Adern yeah. or Adernay. Who knows? I mean, there's there's no way you're ever gonna pronounce all the names and stuff correctly. No. <laughs> True. <laughs> maybe if you are a history major, maybe. I That's correct. true. Any history majors in chat? Pipe up about like the uh, pronunciation of the city. You need to pronounce the e at the end, so it's Adernay. Okay. Um, why doesn't he have walls in here? Do, would you not build walls in Adernay? I think he's been somewhat surprised in the last turns by the amount of units that they actually are. I thought he thought maybe that he had enough units to defend himself with. Hmm. I would have thought like a nice little preemptive wall here would have been nice to keep you safe. I think sure. so too. Yeah, it's interesting that he didn't do that. You know what's interesting? He's going for a normal age yet again. I don't think he's any way of getting a golden red. He's like eight points away. He oh, he's thinks eight points with five turns left. Yeesh. He might be banking that uh, Nubia might this time around not hit their golden age, but looks like maybe they can do it. With all the engineers that they've been projecting for. Yeah, they're very close. They're about halfway to that great engineer. They've got two turns until another project, so there's a good chance they can do it. They've got a builder in Echo as well that they might be able to chomp on. I noticed that he's went for a really interesting naming scheme. Is this the... Is this a rule that was implemented that all cities have to be named? Or is this just him being funny? This is his thing that he's done forever. He likes naming his cities Alpha Bravo and all that stuff. Oh, GG is called. Really? Ooh. Well, no way. Really? That surprises me a lot. Me too. Oh. I guess this was just a battle of uh, mental fortitude after all. Yeah, I wonder, are we going to are we gonna go ask them? Why they, well, I guess we get to ask them at the end of the series, right? Oh, we can ask them right now, actually. Hold on. There's a post-game chat very quick. Oh, yeah, let's pop down in there. Um, let me invite you in a sec. Yeah, they're not there yet. Maybe they're dis still discussing with the teammates. Makes sense. Yeah, this is the best of three. There will be at least one more game, potentially two more games. So do stay t tuned. 
Um, but this was really interesting. I'm really curious as to why they decided to surrender because I feel like they were in a rough spot, but I don't think they were dead yet, were they? Maybe they were. I mean, if you can uh, like see that you're not doing well, if you can see that you're going to die, it makes sense to call it, especially if it's a series and you don't want to sit here all evening. Mm. And it looked like uh, Brazil was actually fighting back on the top. He killed a lot of the Marianos, actually. He did. I think some of those yeeted themselves in um, when yeah. the AI took over, though. But, like, yeah, the, the army score right now for Egypt, I mean, they were 400 points ahead of Pedro, and now they're only 200 points. So he is like, clawed it back massively. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an invite now for the voice channel to for post-game, if you want to go. Perfect. I'll see you guys there. Hello. 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 Map was not super fun for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it didn't you, look amazing to yeah. play on. So much back and forth. Yeah. GG, man, what a game. Yeah. So, I was a bit surprised that Noob um, didn't rush for uh, Marianne. Huh? <laughs> I was surprised that uh, Noob uh, didn't rush Marianne. Me too. No comment from Noob, huh? Is this uh, Initiation Rights Monumentality chop every tile special? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, no but Warlords thrown. You don't need it. I just need to not lose that city. And then yeah. It. yeah. I mean, I, I saw your Forest Fire and your 3 3 1 Coffin with 3 3, and I knew my only chance to have a, to keep up with this is a full cheese. So I just did everything to get horses as quick as I could on your city because it was so close. Fish, how did you feel when the scout died? Um, sad to, to put it uh, to put it plainly. I don't know. We I couldn't use any horses because under the gun, big yeah. horse enthusiast. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I I don't know. Maybe I should have built another scout at some point. A two. I thought two. I could get it. You know. But uh, I don't know. I kept him pinned down. I think. And uh, the point was I could just kind of get a little bit of gold for under to hang in there. Good we were wondering me. why you guys chose to keep the map. So I think it was clear why John and Noob chose to keep the map. But what about you guys, Fish and Under the Gun? So turn 10, we thought they will be split and cannot trade. <laughs> and so we figured it would be a good map for us. I don't know. What was the reason, Fish? I mean, I got um, Popot. I got Popot. Pop was one of them. Yeah, yeah. So Popot, um, I had like decent expands like remember bravo had all those good tiles bravo was um, nice. and then i knew that there was an opponent for me to to archer rush so it's not like i'm backline naval sim fest um what else i mean we could do worse here we could do much worse so this yes. was better to better to do this um that's wasn't it, you really. wasn't you afraid about um egypt with relic and um initiation rate I was very afraid, yeah. <laughs> I don't think we saw the relic, did we? Uh, we, we, I mean, I noticed, but when we saw all of I mean, I noticed after we... Re yeah, it I was know, after, it was after, I after think. After remap, like, we mm -hmm. didn't think of it when we remapped. But I, I remember seeing that the bar, you know, the great work thing got added. <laughs> I don't know, it was just too much going on. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the pop art is so OP. Like, my cap is yeah. very productive. And... I don't know, Victor 3 Gaming... Uh, <laughs> can be good. Cross shot. Well, GG. GG, yeah. GG. Super fun game to watch. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, hyper aggressive. Not all of them are like this. The last game was yeah. turn 112, uh, late game uh, <laughs> test. Anything goes here. That's the, that's the well, fun. now that those civs are banned, maybe it's a little bit more chill for the game, too. <laughs> I mean, I think the normal TVT draft is super, like, there's like you know, six or seven, so if you can play this one, it'll yeah. be more fun. Mm -hmm. I really guys... do feel like the Ottoman Egypt combo is super tasty, though. I mean, looks like, well, they can totally trade. We thought they couldn't, but they could totally trade. And so if this went longer and if we didn't derail them, then they crush us with GPT later. Personally, I'm. Um... just comes down to the noob city, and then he loses his uh... tempo for the push. That's true. When do you get? Do you have yeah, civil by now? Like, do you have melee ally, or when do you get? It? We have civil in like two turns or something. Like that, oh, I think. Really 
It's um, super late. I personally think Mutation is not the greatest Tiff. It's very hard to get golden, so you might be a normal Aja, just like John in this game. And I don't know, like the pure value of Mutation is not too fantastic. And on this map, like you didn't really bully with scouts and archers as per usual early game, so I that was really this good. map is more of an anomaly than the rest of them, because this yeah. map is just not good as our, any Civ, I don't think. And we can't really see yours, but yeah. How close are um, you were from golden? Uh, I had 11, I think. Oh, okay. It was not close. I mean, I could have got like one more point if I'd settled Coastal Desert. Or maybe I could have goofed on the ground then as well, but it didn't seem that good. Yeah. Alright, I'll take very small, very short break and see you soon. Do one of you just want to put up lobby when everybody goes? Oh, yeah, I should be. Okay, I can put up lobby. Yeah. How do you feel? When do you think Let's you will go. play a game too? You wanna go like 10 15 minutes break and then go? Mm hmm. It's good. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. GG, guys. GG. Thank you guys for the game. Are you casting uh, the next game as well? Absolutely. Potato? As long as long okay. as I'm welcome to cast, I will cast. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, you well. are. Oh, what an exciting weekend. Holy yeah. moly. <laughs> yeah, I, I really like a tournament uh, which begin in uh, end in one weekend. Yes, mm -hmm. it's very nice. It's very nice to have a one weekend tournament. They just uh, knock out stage. You lose one one game, you're out. It's a pretty cool format. I mean, it there does... was the entire month before where we were just playing games for the leaderboard, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we, we qual like qualifying is tough, of course, but once you're mm -hmm. you have a spot. Uh, the next okay. match will be in five to ten uh, minutes, maybe 15 yeah, I made to the 20. Game. Take your break. Get ready yeah. for the next one. See you. Thank you, Corny. See you. Good luck. Yep. Um, shall we jump back into our own chat? And I'm going to take like a five minute break to go get some water. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Okay. So please do keep my chat entertained, if you will. Okay, okay. I'll be right back. Well, Cynthia, what do you want to talk about? Hmm. Should we decide what we're doing next? Are we casting the next game or are we going to play the custom map? I think Potato's done to keep casting now. I mean, the the custom map that, like, okay, maybe to explain this to chat, we wanted to to make, like, the entry into this whole 2v2 cup a little bit easier. We wanted to have, like, a custom 2 versus AI map that you could just, you know, jump and play and train on your own. Where you have, like, a bit of a scenario, a little bit of roleplay as well. But it's not really entirely ready yet. There are still some bugs on it. But uh, hopefully we can fix them this week still. Got it. I mean, it's somewhat playable, but uh, not really. Where you can release it publicly and not be embarrassed about it. What do you think is your favorite format of Civ to play? Hmm... I do enjoy getting up at 5 a.m. for the CCC, the clan, cup, or CPL, <laughs> and playing the insane timer duels. That's always <laughs> That's been a lot of fun. Duels are interesting. I I normally hate duels. I'm not. Mm -hmm. I don't really like playing a game by myself, sitting alone in silence. But I can definitely see why people like them. I enjoy the occasional pub duel. Well. I mean, it's just like, if you play by yourself, you usually play Civ with some music on or something like this. You don't really get to do this if you're trying to like actually play and communicate with people. And it's not an FFA. Honestly, someone said in chat that they love marathon mode on a large island map, and I can 100% get behind that. <laughs> marathon playing, mode is so fun. I was playing Civ 5 games in marathon speeds for like so long <laughs> when I was little. <laughs> Yeah, it's fun. I think the 6v6s also have a lot of appeal. We can just hang out usually. The time is very long. Can make some friends, can chat. I really, I really, really, really like 6v6. And you can be very creative about what you want to do the game because it likely doesn't depend on you at all. <laughs> <laughs> Join the pub lobby with the most mods and do your best. <laughs> with the most mods. You know, I think your mistake was that you didn't get your ex to play marathon mode with you. I think that's where two versus AI comes in. 
<laughs> yeah. I'm also looking forward to see how season two turns out. With the inclusion of all the more meta sifts compared to like the, the war sifts that we've been seeing now. How people mm -hmm. change their minds maybe about draft, also in other formats. Mm -hmm. Maybe you know what, see. I agree. I think quick games have their place. A marathon mode is really nice because you can just sit down with it for a, for a month and just play a little bit every weekend. But... Mm. If you're the kind of person who enjoys coming back to it, I guess, yeah. Yeah. If you take a week break, you might just feel a little bit lost. Like, what am I doing? What was I doing? Where am I? <laughs> can you give us any spoilers on the custom map? What is the concept? Uh, I think the next game will probably start in the next 15 minutes, guys. Well, we were looking to, I don't know, have like a little bit of a story with it. Um, you spawn with your buddy, and you have to fight your way through a bunch of deity AI. And you have to escort a settler and settle it in the middle of Mount Doom, as if you were playing Lord of the Rings with your friend, and dropping <laughs> the one ring. Really? So it's like sort of a like get the treasure over the finish line kind of game? Mm hmm okay. We were experimenting a little bit also with uh, how difficult we wanted it to make. Interesting. I can't wait to... If you, you think sense. that's long, just play Play by Cloud. I have a game I've been playing since before COVID was a thing. That's insane. I mean, that's enough time to like <laughs> Fall in love, get married, start a family. <laughs> and you're still trying to beat this darn FFA. <laughs> you know, I've actually heard a lot of great things in, in talking to the Play by Cloud community. I think someone once told me that it is the true spirit of multiplayer Civ. It's just a group of people passing around a save by email. And yeah, you just come back to it every weekend and you get to talk to each other in between your turns. Do you actually ever talk to your play by cloud friends though? Like you just message each other, each other right? It's like not the usual experience of a team where you sit in the voice chat. Yeah, so Nomad Beard will correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that um, you, you start a game. So, you know, you can, you can share your save files around. They're really small files. So every single person will go in order and you'll play your turn, you'll save it, and then you'll send it on to the next person. And um, you can play on your own time. I think most people say you can expect to spend maybe 10 minutes to 30 minutes every weekend <laughs> and just kind of play a turn a week or something like that. And if life gets in the way at some point in those two years of the game, you can sub yourself out. But in the in the meantime, you have Discord, and you can hop into the Discord channel and just type to each other about the game and talk to each other about your game. Are you guys giving advice to people who are interested in playing 2v2? Play by <laughs> Cloud, actually. Have you ever heard of that game format, Potato? I don't know if it's the format for you, but uh, it works for a lot of people. I would lose interest very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I do think, okay. though, play by cloud was a classic or play by email. I think it used to be called was like a classic way to keep a game going. Yeah, it, they still do it by email. There's a website, but they just call it PVC for short. Right. Potato, what are your three favorite sibs for multiplayer? Do you have any? Well, I'll or give you, you I'll give you my like? three favorite sibs. Now, normally my answer to this question is that I don't really have favorite things in life at all. I usually have like a thing that I like a lot right now. Um, yeah. But I'm going to try to give you my best honest answer. And so obviously at the top of that list is going to be the Kamai because I love playing the Kamai. I love doing Domri pushes. I love building aqueducts. Mm -hmm. I love building holy sites. They literally fit into everything that I want to do as a sieve, like mm -hmm. perfectly. Um, then the next one, this is a little bit harder because the Kamai is the only sieve that I've really ever thought about. Like that would be my number one. But my number two would probably be Mali. I really like sieves that kind of break the rules of the game and play very differently. Mm. So 
the fact that your mines give you gold and you're very faith focused and gold purchasing focused that's like super interesting to me i think that's really exciting way to play the game because you can make huge plays with your purchases i think i saw you play the new mali recently actually which one is your favorite Ooh, which one is my favorite the new mali do i want to play it's hard to say i think if you get the god set up on the base game mali it's like 36 gold per city or something absurd um boss the new mali I, I think the new mali is just more exciting right now for me but either or i'm happy to play both um the thing i like about the great works for the new mali is their great works of writing are essentially like mines that you can move around the map like it's super cool <clears throat> Ooh. Ten dollars and zero cents. I think if you make off Cleopatra video, HGPT per writer is also pretty big compared to like the god setup of the biggest flat desert city that you could possibly imagine. That's true. I feel like the flat desert scales better because you can put all your traders in that city, right? Very true. Um, but the and third you can, save, you can put some account improvement on those tiles as well. That's true. That's true. <laughs> What I find really challenging about Molly is that there are a lot of different ways to play the Civ. You can go, you can do a religious idols, you can do a desert folklore, and it all really depends on your spawn and on information that you don't always have when you have to pick your pantheon on like turn five or whatever it is. So it's so stressful for me. I feel like I really have to get those first few turns right. And the timer is so short the first few turns. It just, it feels like you're like, 15 again and being told to pick your major for uni and what you're going to do for the rest of your life. It's terrifying. <laughs> Sorry, I had to dash away from the computer for a split second there. That's um, a small way of seeing it, yeah. It's, it's challenging. I mean, I think that that's what makes some people so good at playing Molly. It's they, they know instinctively what the right pantheon choice is and you know, do you go straight for your Sagubas or do you go for holy sites first? Do you go mining? A lot, think, of, a lot of decisions to make on a Sunday. That's true. I think the hard thing with Mali too is if you don't have desert for that extra, like if you don't settle on the edge of a desert for like that extra growth, you're building two districts in every, in every city almost, right? Because you're going to get a holy site and you're probably going to get a commercial hub. And then you need seven pop to actually get like a theater square or a campus or like a game winning district. Are you a plaza? Mm -hmm. If I may interrupt, I drop the link again for the next lobby. Perfect. I will yoink Arena that link Arena and we shall join the game. Let's go. Filthy Robot put out some amazing videos for Civ 6 when it first came out. He did. He actually still streams. He doesn't stream Civ 6, but he plays other games. Still worth watching. I love, used to love his content as well. Same. I used to love watching the Civ 5, Civ 5 multiplayer stuff. Mm -hmm. I almost became a mm -hmm. Civ 5 multiplayer player. I was all, it was almost going to be that guy, but then I was the single player dude. Um, I think I swap it under here or no, Mal, yeah. Oh, well, I've got zero MS to Boone. So do I have to rejoin if I've got zero MS? I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, let's make sure that we got everything right. Yes. <clears throat> Perfect. Right, I've got MS to everybody and I am in my position. You're playing. I am. I, d I, d I didn't know. This will be even more exciting than we expected. <laughs> they might want to make uh, they might want to wait till everyone has joined before they swap because sometimes it can also mess up with the lobby right okay that makes sense yeah the whole networking. Okay, <laughs> that guy doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> um, the whole network Boone. around it is just not very optimized, sadly. 
Yes, unfortunately. I was talking about this with um, a couple of people and I feel like the big thing, the big innovation for the next Civ game would be if they could get more stable netcode. Here's the thing about Civ netcode. It is like super stable if you're all in the same LAN connection or all yes. in the, But if you are have internet between you, if there's like lost packets, if there's any stuff like that, it's just That's grim. How different is Civ 6 multiplayer? Uh, you need to swap with under the gun, I think. Yep, I have swapped. I've clicked the button to swap with him. Oh, sorry, sorry. I have some delay. Guys, I just went to Filthy's stream and asked why he doesn't play Civ anymore. And he just says, I'm not interested in playing Civ. <laughs> but he did make, <laughs> but he did, he did, he does have a, a command set up, exclamation point Civ, that takes you to his latest YouTube video from 2020. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe yeah. someone should tell him about Civ 7. Yeah. I think he played so much Civ Five that it kind of ruined the game for him. I I can't swap it under the gun. I'm clicking it. There we go. Um, I yeah, but if I had to guess, right, he just wanted like something a little bit more intellectually stimulating, like w in terms of variety. <clears throat> Maybe, but Civ Six and Civ Five feel incredibly di different to me, to be honest. They are two very different games, purely for me because of the placement of districts and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of the people that still play Civ Five, really, I mean, I think maybe put Plato, um, Filthy also falls in this category. I think they just never really got into Civ Six at all. Yes, it's because they're very different games. Um, mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I think a lot of the people that love Civ Five and the way Civ Five plays, they still play it. Like, they're like Civ Five has like fifteen thousand people playing at any one time. It's insane. Considering that's like a 13 year old game, it's still got that kind of player numbers. Um, considering it's also had like zero updates, no new boosts or anything like that. Well, the people who are still playing it usually play it with like the lag mod as well, which is also like a gameplay overhaul. Yes. And also, I think it's, is it lag or yeah? L A K L E K, I think. Yes, Lech mod is awesome. They put in an Ar Ireland sieve. They put in a whole bunch of new sieves, a lot of new mechanics, completely overhauled civic trees, uh, culture trees rather. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually played a game of Civ Five Lech mod multiplayer earlier this week, um, or was it last week? I don't even remember anymore. Oh crap! I need to send my audio <laughs> for that game in. <laughs> Whoops! I'll, do, I'll have to do that tomorrow. <clears throat> Yeah, I don't know. I feel like mods like these are actually great. It's like there's still new content being released as well. Like it keeps it always exciting, always fresh. Yes, I'm really, I'm really hopeful that the modding scene, the modding scene stays strong for the next Civ game. Looks like we've got a Georgia ban. Is that expected? Ah. <laughs> I mean, the, the Civs that are left, are like probably on the worst end of the spectrum, like on the worst of the worst end. <laughs> And like, Georgia, it might be one of those, but it is pretty strong with the unique unit as well. The Questors. The Kevsers can do some yeah. work. Ottoman bands. That's the oh, that's the Vizier Ottoman, right? Kanuni, I think it's called, or something like this. Kanuni. It sounds like a pastry. I'm gonna go down to the <laughs> shop and get some kanunis. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and they're gonna be like really creamy as well. Yeah, it sounds like it's made of phyllo pastry, and like, yeah. <laughs> I think, by the way, there's like sort of like a Witcher mod in development for Civ Six with like the Witcher landscape as well, and like new leaders, new loot units. It's gonna feel like entirely different from Civ Six. Interesting. Maybe I've actually I'm spreading, maybe I'm spreading wrong rumors, but I, I have heard about this. 
I played a Witcher Civ mod in the sense that they had custom civs that held all like the Witcher abilities. Um, and it was super, super fun, super interesting. I'm pretty sure I have like a couple of mod spotlight videos on my channel, guys. By the way, Potato McWhiskey, uh, youtube.com forward slash Potato McWhiskey. Go check out my videos, uh, which obviously you're already watching it. No, uh, Korea and Kamai picked here. Korea for Noob and Kamai for Under the Gun. Under the gun. I'm very happy to see Kamai here. I love Kamai. I love their scaling off of uh, population. I love their food. I love their faith. I love everything about them. Uh, so how do Kamai stack up here in this list of civs? I think that, well, you, you're you the Kamai player, but I feel like you want to be pretty free sim on that civ for as long as you possibly can to get set up. Getting rushed before monumentality can be really devastating, and getting rushed before grandmasters is also pretty annoying. So I'm not sure. I feel like there's a lot of yeah, with that Mongolia pick, for instance. I feel like there's a lot of opportunity. Guess I have just been told by Falcon that we have the honor of choosing the MVP of this series. Ooh, who do you think is winning it so far? No, 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 like an individual player, not just the team. That's what I mean. Like, who do you think yeah. is MVP so far? Of the last game? Mm. I don't think we've seen an MVP yet, to be honest. I'd like to reserve that. I mean, I feel like everyone played well and everyone played poorly in this game. Everyone made mistakes <laughs> and everyone played good, had good plays. So it's I really don't know. hard to say. I feel like the standout moment to me is capturing that Egyptian city and then raising it later. Like, that was clutch. Yeah, that was... If anything was a hero play, I guess this was it. Maybe shooting the skull down as well from Task Force Flash. That was pretty good. Yeah, Before both of those moves. But yeah, um, it's something to keep thinking about while we watch this game. Who are the hosts beside Potato? Uh, they should be listed in the title of the video, but I'm here with Corny. The first stirrings of life beneath water. Hello. Hello. And synth. The great beasts of the Stone Age. You guys, do you guys have YouTube channels or Twitches you want to share? Or no, no, fun? Potato, I just watch yours. <laughs> See, based. This is exactly the kind of co-host I want. No competition. It, all the views go to me, all the acclaim, all the fame, all the money. I mean, your district discount video was really good. I watched it before I had ever met you or heard your name before. And I was like, this guy makes good videos. Very true. The district discount video is super good. Very helpful. There's like a, there's one part of that video that's a little bit unclear, um, and I got the same question over and over again. So I almost want to remake it. <laughs> I do stream sometimes, but it's more like just for the enemy team <laughs> to watch the POV afterwards if they want to like learn from the game or something like this. Right, makes it's sense. It's something that helped me a lot when I was like trying to improve, like <clears throat> rewatching the games. That's I'm like a very actually... StarCraft thing to do, right? You watch your mm -hmm. replays. Like when no one else is on my team is streaming, which is usually not the case nowadays. I will drop a stream sometimes. Based. I appreciate that. Um, what other games did you guys play? Did you ever play like Dota or StarCraft or anything, Potato? Yes, I played a lot of Dota. I played a lot of StarCraft. I played a lot of League of Legends. I played a lot of Anarchy Online. I played, I've played, listen, I don't leave the house, okay? <laughs> Let me just put it that way. <laughs> well, I have like 3,000 hours in Sims 4, so. Base. I don't judge. I don't judge. How many simulated people have you drowned in pools? Be honest. Oh, potato. We can get so much more creative than that. How much time do you got? <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. Uh, I don't think I'll be casting with Synth anymore because she's a little crazy. <laughs> she's a psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> so someone from chat thinks that Khmer is in a rel spawn. What do you guys think? It actually might be worth going over what bonuses the surf actually does get with these mods. If you want to do that, Potato. Yeah, sure. So the Kamai are a little bit changed in this mod. They still get these cities with an aqueduct to get plus one amenity and farms adjacent to an aqueduct to get plus two food if it's adjacent uh, and then plus one faith if it's adjacent to a holy site. Jaya Varman himself. Uh, of course, they have the Domri and the Prasat. The Domri is basically the same from what I can tell. It's mm -hmm. The main difference is it's upgradable from a catapult, I think. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the leader ability is where like the changes were made. Yes. Jeff uh, Moment. <laughs> Uh, so the Kamai ability here is Holy Sites are granted a major adjacency in faith and food with rivers and plus two housing if it's on a river. So major, I believe, is plus two. So plus two exactly. food, plus two faith. That's quite good. And then the Prasat. And you can get the Prasat pretty quick here, right? It's plus six faith, which is two faith over a normal temple. And you get 0 0.3 culture for every pop in the city. This is a really, really strong, like, tempo save if you can get the Prasats mm -hmm. really quickly. Also, this might be something that you could try a CV with catch one because as you saw like you get also tourism at flight for these samples that's based, true based at the population actually one thing to consider here is that simon bolivar is like the perfect wall for Khmer, right he's got this incredibly tight choke point and boats can't get around the bottom boats can't get around the top the only way to get to the Khmer's empire would be through mongolia who you don't think of as a boat sieve although he does have a really nice grand uh Great Barrier Reef over here. Mm -hmm. But if Kamai is free sim and goes for culture, there's a chance they could do it. I think you're right. I think we might see some tanks or helicopters swimming in the late game through the sea. Tanks can't swim. Don't be silly. You need to make amphibious <laughs> tanks. Come on now. Yeah, we'll see. Oh, that's actually a really good point. Uh, Grand Columbia and Kamai can do naval trading through this lake. That's going to be huge. Colombia might not be too happy with their spawn or other, but they will get to do what they did last game yet again to JJJ. Just exactly be a... the same scenario. Oh, poor JJJ. He doesn't know. He doesn't know his neighbor is yet. Already cracking out, looks like three scouts. Did he get one of those scouts for free or is three scouts the meta here? They, he might have made two and they might have bought one, but uh, we missed it. There's no way to know for sure. Mm. Turns are ticking over quickly. We're about to pick up a, a hut here. So, what are you guys betting on this hut? Maybe it's a relic again. Dude, if it's a relic again. A relic event. Oh, XP. That might have just been from the one that, to be honest. Yeah, true. Um, actually, yeah, maybe it was. You might be right. Yep. Yeah, I think it was. So, I don't know what he picked up. One thing I noticed that a lot of multiplayer pros do is it gets to a certain point in the game and they stop scouting and they just like move all their scouts to the front line. Is the, uh, like, what is the reason for that? Is it just because they're, they already have units and they can control like a little bit of space? Uh, you moving units to the front line already? Well, like, okay. yes. I'm sorry, I missed the entire question. I mean, you, you want to co like control the space for like satellites and such. Uh, like you want to control it yourself and you want to block your enemy. Yes. Uh, my question was, sometimes I see pro players to stop scouting and bring their scouts home to fight on the front line. Is that because they just don't perceive much value from continuing to scout? Mm, I don't know if you can phrase <laughs> the question this way, to be honest. Uh, I mean... They, there's like advantages to having like some scouts around for support and flanking and such, right? Yes. There's the situation in the last game where we had like a scout that could have taken a city because it was just range units. That's true. But like controlling the space, controlling a, like protecting your districts, protecting your saddles, protecting your traders. It's also very important. As we are about to see right here. Oh boy. So what do you guys think? Remap or no? Well, they do have Khmer with a lot of space on one side. They do have coastal control on the other side. The other team, it is an east versus west. Mm. I think both teams can be maybe a little bit happy with this. I think for I different reasons. I feel like I give the advantage to east here because the eastern war player is next to the the western sim player, right? Yeah, true, but. Um, John and Noob both picked like very sim heavy sifts to be honest. Like Kublai Mongolia also really gets online only at the Kashyyyks before he doesn't really have relevant bonuses. Oh, that's true. That's a Kublai Mongolia. I thought that was a, Gen a, a Genghis Khan Mongolia. Did I say that name right? It doesn't matter. I think so. Okay, so they voted against a remap, so everyone's happy. <laughs> you might think that there were no remaps at all. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised. 
One thing that will be big in this game though is the city states actually, because they're all like somewhat on the right side of the map. That's true. We do have Valletta. Um, Valletta, of course, allowing you to build, uh, to purchase walls using faith, as well as any building that can be built in a city center or a encampment. Then we have Granada, which allows your builders to make Alcazars. I don't think Alcazars are particularly important unless you're like super hardcore rushing a tourism victory. And uh, Nalanda, quite good, as is Mexico. Although I don't think Mexico is going to come into the game, but in Amahi, Amahi, oh my God, I can't say it, Amaha Vihara. <laughs> That could be pretty clutch, depending on the tech that it un unlocks. Mm. I think Valletta is just going to die, though, to be honest. Who do you think to, is going to kill it? That's Simon, right? It's like, maybe not entirely on the way to where he wants to go. Mm, that's true. Free Chariot here, potentially, if he picks this up. Yeah, he's waiting for turn 15. Before turn 15, you only get two boosts, yeah. But after turn 15, you actually get the chariot. This is kind of how the situation was solved, where you just pick up the chariot on turn 2 and then just bully your neighbor with it. Interesting. Because I'm pretty sure there's a thing with tribal villages too, where if you pick them up before a certain turn, they have like a reduced list of things you can get from them. Yeah, there's something with this about relics, I think, that I only... Ah, actually, that I don't think that's true. But something, yeah. <laughs> there, There is something there, yeah. I think that is a good point. The Nalanda will probably be the most important city-state to control in this game. And nobody's really in a position to kill it, except maybe Colombia. So I feel like I give them, like you said, a good advantage here. Um, you know what's actually going to be interesting? Um, he moved the settler from Alpha, like up now, because he felt like there were too many units at the bottom to where he could safely settle there, because he was also protecting the chariot. But now he might get blocked. Where he wants mm. to go. That would be really annoying. And you got to be thinking here, as JJJ, you see all this um, chocolate and you know that that settler wants to come over here. Oh, he doesn't actually see that. I don't know. I think he will just settle the 2-1 right there. Right here in this mountain range? Yeah. Oh, okay. He stepped up a little bit. I think he wants to get to that chocolate at least. It's a really good first tile. Yeah. He looks a little bit screwed. <laughs> you think you think he's dead? No, 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 not at all. But I think he's been forced to make some decisions that he didn't necessarily want to do. Mm. The campus is being stepped on. Oh, this is actually such a good campus too. Wow. It's got to be frustrating if you're Alpha right now. If you're um, sorry, yeah, if you're Task Force. I mean, it's okay. You just make a slinger, you make a monument, and then you will have cleared the tile, right? It's not that big of a deal. Let's check in in Kamai. Uh, a double holy site coming out. He actually went two settler into holy sites, which I respect a lot. So he's going for a three city religion opener, which I feel like is a very natural play for the Kamai, especially if you've got the rivers for those holy sites, which he does. Mm -hmm. Um, so I expect to see a lot of faith coming out of him. Sims are looking pretty flat across the board. How is Kublai Khan, Kublai Khan going along? Uh, looks like he's got his second settler out. His first, his second city's almost got the monument too. He's going to have to think a bit about how he wants to like do districts on this one. Doesn't look super obvious. There's like jungle, there's like masonry resources like stone. Mm, this looks really awkward to clear out because he's going to need both masonry and bronze working just to make like a little district pile here. Exactly. Going to be interesting to see what he comes up with. And he has really awkward fresh water as well. Like if we look at his point of view, where does he settle this third city to like make yeah, it? Yeah, it's like super challenging. I mean, it's, it's okay on that lake, but like it's super challenging to do this kind of stuff on this fast of a time as well. Mm -hmm. like you see it's like 40 seconds now. It used to be even faster like the last couple of turns. Yep. I like it though. I love the rapid fire nature of the games. It's super fun. I mean, this is only for the tournament, or so that the games are like fast, right? Like this, you don't have to play with this if you don't want to. <laughs> That's true. You could even play one turn a day with play by email. <laughs> so it looks like uh, Korea is getting their their unique Saya ones out, and it looks like he's also going to be settling the dead. Oh, sorry, this is Lake Kazan. 
um, which is two gold, one production, two food, and two culture. Very nice, natural wonder. Sorry, Lake Retba. I don't know why I said Kazan. You know what's also going to be interesting in this game? Uh, you know, might know about Kublai Mongolia's, or Mongolia's ability in general, that they get like double the diplomatic visibility. Yes. And currently they're completely unscouted. So they can put a spy on the enemy, while the enemy can't put a spy on them. Ooh, that could be big, especially if he gets terracotta and he gets that spy leveled. Exactly. That could be plus 12 combat strength. That's absurd. Scouting matters. It does. Actually, let's take a look at scouting. What's the Kamai? Uh, yeah, they don't know much. And he, he's not going to be able to get that scout passed. No, they're doing a good job of blocking him. And they must be playing around this. Like, they know that that's a thing, that you don't want your, your Mongolia player to get scouted. Yeah. This is but really scary. Force trying to force you uh, trying to force your way through and then end up just losing the scout for free is also not good. Yep, yep, yep. You can get creative in the late game again. Once it like if Kamir hits like cartography, he can send like horses through the water, like at the top and the bottom maybe. To find the city that way. You yeah, I suppose that could work. You could sneak your way over. Seeing a trader come out, another slinger coming out. This is obviously we're setting up for a little bit of an early skirmish over here between the two cities of Charlie and Daegu. There's so much action around already. But Korea has three slingers now, soon in total. Mm, that must be a setup for early crossbowmen, right? Is he heading towards the... What is that unit called that they have? The Huacha? Yeah, it's on gunpowder though. It's quite a while yet till he gets there. It's essentially a field cannon, but it can't shoot without, like, a general. Hmm, it's like a siege unit. Yeah, it's a field cannon, but a siege unit. So how much earlier does that come? It actually comes quite a bit earlier, wow. Mm-hmm, it's really scary. So Korea... pushes are really tough to defend if they're done properly. Yeah, that sounds really, really scary. Korea kind of puts a bit of a timer on the game for Colombia to do damage. And speaking of doing damage, he has actually done damage. A camp is here getting pillaged yeah. by a cute little scout sneaking in. He's opening campuses. Korea's obviously opening campuses. But he will get a free general from his ability. Very soon, once the Golden Age hits. And that general also works on archers. So that will be also very scary for Korea for a while. So the Grand Colombian ability for Great Generals, does that only activate on Golden Ages now? You get it at every age turnover, yes. Ah. On General. Oh, right, the Commandant General. Right, 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 right. I was thinking of earning Great General points, but it's a completely different thing. I forgot how Grand yes, Columbia yes, works. Yes. Already seeing trade between Mongolia and Korea here, and there's a settler moving out as well. Um, Mongolia must be super happy here. Look how hard he is simming. A settler, a builder, and a builder in queue. Nothing else. Just ready to expand, chop, and expand. I mean, Kublai Mongolia has some pretty decent sim bonuses, right? You get the free economic card. Uh, also in the mod, it was added that all traders, all externals, uh, give you one science and one culture more. Ooh, I like that. That's cool. Bit of a reward. Mm -hmm. For uh, trading internationally. How are we liking the position of Kamai? It looks like he's projecting for great profit. Is that maybe for era score? Let's take a look. So there's six turns left on this era. Golden Age, Golden Age, non-Golden Age, non-Golden Age. Oh, why would he be projecting if he doesn't need the Golden Age? Does he just want to get the religion up now? Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, he has two shrines already, I think. He could wait, I suppose. He doesn't need it. But maybe he just wants to get properly core music right now. Ooh, choral music plus prasat means you basically don't need to build theater squares. Like, if you want to do a strong, yeah. like... Oh, you do anyways. <laughs> and then you actually have, like, so we potential. It's true, Catch it's true. On. But you wouldn't need it, necessarily, if you just want to get, like, the tanks into fascism. Mm -hmm. he, could, he could be the late game carry here, just power hard. Two settlers coming out alongside a holy site. He is setting up for a super wide game. It looks like he's going to be simming here pretty hard. Yeah, he's in a really good spot. 
I'm kind of curious though about his freshwater like how many more river holy sites is he going to get this game he actually he has at least one over here and then a couple more over here um I suppose technically no I don't know if he could settle that way I don't think he wants to settle the right coast if he doesn't do it early enough he will have to deal with Mongolia on the coast there's no way he can like compete with like the capital and the second expand if it's like a sixth city yes there's no way I mean, you, you see Xanadu right now and you might think, this isn't coastal at all, but you can always put like a second ring harbor. Mm-hmm, that's true. You pop down that second ring harbor, boom, you're able to crank out Caravals and it's actually harder to counterattack you because you can't walk right up to your city. Um, seeing an encampment come out here from Daegu, where is that encampment? Here, in between the cities. Is this him setting up a battle line? Yeah, probably. Or is there we, some... were just, we were just talking about your district discount video last time. This is actually discounted, so this is done properly. Really? Oh, he has one, two sale ones finished. I wonder how many districts he has unlocked. I mean, probably just campuses and browns. I don't think he's on state work for this. No. Yet. Ah, he's, he's actually taking military tradition to delay that, I think. Probably. <laughs> clever, clever, clever. Also squeezing out the fourth city. That might be a bit greedy compared to Colombia, who's still uh, sitting on three. He's still sitting on three, and he's going for a horseman. Oh, archer instead. Also, he went for Magnus. Mm. So he will have a bit of a production advantage with these shops. He will. Do we see any pantheons, actually? That might inform us what people might be doing. So, uh... Mongolia went for religious settlements that's what is that one it gives you in this mod it doesn't give you free settler it gives you 20% towards setup production and it gives you two free tiles in the city that you settle that's pretty decent I think that's is that really that good I mean you might prefer something like city page when, to be honest but if it's something you can grab like on turn like four or something it's pretty fucking good that's true it's true he did have the pearls here but it only looks like he's just improved them could have been an early pantheon um, Daegu God of the Forge so strategic resources give plus one production and plus one faith right or no what did we talk about God that's of craftsman God of that's... the Forge is the one that lets the one turn off <laughs> that's right it's a 30% production boost towards ancient and classical military units I keep getting that one mixed up uh, yep. No Pantheon yet on Grand Columbia, feeling the heat. But we do actually have a full religion out from the Khmer, and it does look like it's River Goddess with Choral Music and Tithe, covering all of his bases there. Amenities, housing, culture, and gold. Very classic. You might want to go for something else other than Tithe, but you might also feel the pressure in this 2v2 to just support your ally on the front line. That's what I was thinking. He's probably wanting the gold to be able to support Grand Columbia's army. It seems like, so this map is interesting, East versus West, you've got Grand Columbia versus Korea tussling in the middle, but theoretically, I mean, if both players are of equal skill, Khmer should outsim Mongolia here every time, right? Why do you think so? Well, Khmer is a big sim civ. You have a lot of sim bonuses with population, with your faith. If you're left alone, you should be able to scale to a better place in the late game. But Mongolia doesn't really have any sim bonuses. Well, he does have the extra economic slot. He does have the trader thing. But the, the like the main bonus of that self would be the diplomatic visibility. And that seems to be going very well for him this game. Mm, that's true. So if they never scout one of Noob's cities, then he's going to have potentially plus six in the late game. I mean, plus 12, even if he gets level 2 spy and they can't get one on him at all. Yeah. That's insane. And maybe even with the Diplo Merchant. Ooh, the Diplo Merchant could be big, actually, here. But he does only have harbors now. It's not up yet, Potato. I'm sorry. No. I just checked. <laughs> I checked it instinctively. So, is going for harbors here, is this a conscious commitment from Mongolia to say that I am going to try to caravel or battleship or frigate attack the other continent. He wants admirals in case there's a naval <clears throat> fight, right? But also, like, look at 
where would he put like commercials? Like he's so limited on tiles in his cities, actually. That's right. true. Interesting choice when putting the harbor in his capital in the lake. That yeah. to me suggests that this is more of an economic decision rather than a war decision. Because if he wanted boats to be able to get out of the city, he would have put it over here, I feel. I agree. I mean, with that assessment, but also I don't think it's necessary. Like even from his vision, I don't think he has to expect to like really commit towards a naval fight if there is one. Yeah, that's true. Like, I mean, if we take a look at his vision, he doesn't even, he knows where the Khmer are in general, but he doesn't know if they're actually coastal and it would be dangerous to make that assumption, wouldn't it? Yeah, it's not worth ruining your sim game around it, I don't think. Um, but we, we should. I hope Korea gets a coastal city here so that they can maybe do a little bit of coastal trading. Although it actually looks like they're mostly avoiding coast. I'm sure they will set it up later. But yeah, the trade is going already anyways. It will probably keep going for like probably 20 more turns. The Kuwait trader. So that's, that's true. Like about the time that he uh, has to set up like naval traders, I suppose. Yeah, naval trade is like super important because it, you get extra yields on naval trade, but maybe yeah. they value other things right now. I mean, well, what I'm talking about is that he wants to get a settler out before this trader actually establishes the trade port. Actually, no, never mind. He's playing Mongolia. They established a trade post instantly, right? Mm. So this might already be fucked for the naval traders. They might not be able to set them up at all because it will probably prioritize the trade post. That's true, actually. Yeah, I think they might be they might be screwed on that. But I mean, they'll still have good trade. It just won't be naval trade. Oh, looks like there's some moves happening here in the center of the map. A lot of horses out, yeah. I count but... one, two, three, four horses and another one in production here for uh Guangzhou Columbia. might actually be in trouble. But there's a horse that he can move up on the one three. It shouldn't die from one tile, but it could die from two. It could, if this chariot maybe shifts down and this horseman shifts down, it could be dangerous. But I'm liking that I see this early aggression, especially from a sieve like Korea. It's fun to see them get into scraps early. He's got more horsemen coming out and he's also working on an encampment training. Looks like he's really valuing that plus one movement and plus five combat strength. I mean, right now he's down five combat strength compared to the entirety of... Uh... Columbia's army. That's true because he has the Commandant General, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. And this is the... Grants one level of promotion to a military unit and gold equal to 50% of the purchase cost. Is there like a tier list of Commandant abilities? I think it's somewhere on the internet. Nothing of this was changed in PPG, I don't think. Interesting, because I feel like some of those abilities are way stronger than the others. First great Very scientist true. coming out, by the way. At least I think it is. Second one. No, no. Yep, first Zhang Heng. Um, Zhang Heng doesn't actually seem that great to me. Hmm. You could skip wheel <laughs> with it. If you have the engineering boost, getting even faster to crossbows. That's true, I suppose. <clears throat> Like you get the free engineering uh, attack even if you don't have wheel and then you can just start attacking uh, crossbows immediately. And the the campus goes down again. Oof. 27 science being exchanged there. Grand if Columbia. We look, if we look at the total yields now, I think, yeah, yeah Columbia is actually ahead of Korea. Just Thanks by a just smidge. Partially. That's, ooh. Ooh, that's going to feel really bad as Korea. Uh, we didn't feel... look at the, the Golden Ages, by the way. That's oh. Everyone hit. Sorry, hold on. Um, How do I check that? There we go. Uh, Penbrush invoice for our good friend Simon Bolivar, getting in plus two culture and plus one gold for each specialty district. The Kamai also went for monumentality, as you would expect, being able to purchase civilian units with faith. Builders and settlers are 10% cheaper. Uh, noob. Our good friend on Kublai Khan also went for Penbrush and Voice, getting him plus two culture, plus one gold for each specialty district, benefiting a lot from that. And Korea also went for Penbrush and Voice Golden Age. So three Penbrushes and Voice and one Monumentality on our good friend Kamai, who has exploded. Where did the sieve come from? I looked over here a few turns ago and there was like three cities. <clears throat> yeah. 
He went for like a six city opening, and then I guess he faith bought another. That is just nutty. He's also getting a Stonehenge. Now, is the Stonehenge build, is that to deny? I'm or... not sure what he actually is looking for from this. Like, you could pick your worship building now, right? Or you could pick, like, something like Defender. Plus eight. Oh, right. Didn't, oh, they changed how Stonehenge works, didn't they? I mean, you get a free Apostle from it, so you can use it to, like, uh, get ev uh, to evangelize. Right, if so that's you basically like a. Have the religion. Yes, there's like a 200 faith injection into your economy. It's super powerful. Mm -hmm. Is it not like this in base game actually? No, I think if you build it, it just. I don't think uh, anything happens. <laughs> if all the religions are gone. Still a bit of a scrappy game going here. Managed to save a horseman here, but I mean, the front line. I feel like this is Grand Columbia's advantage, especially because he has that plus one movement over his enemy giving him just enough mobility in some of this rough terrain to be able to get the advantage. Um, Korea falling back, drawing a very, very sturdy line between Daegu and Guangzhou using horses. He still has enough units, but he has been losing some. I guess Task Force Fish has been losing units as well. A lot of them, to be honest. <laughs> it's just been a scrap. It's a very, very scrappy game. Let's take a look at the combat strength. Ooh, Task Force. He's falling slightly behind on the combat strength. And he is going for Warlord's Throne here. Obviously feeling the pinch on the unit cost. Um, these horsemen, obviously, I think they cost two gold each, right? Yeah, two uh, gold. Yeah. So he wants to get that down to zero with the policy card of the Warlord's Throne. So interesting enough that he didn't actually go for Siaska to like catch up maybe a little bit. And then swing the units back. Hmm. It's a good point. He might just be leaving that CSK to his teammate, maybe? To give him get him even further ahead. Oh, is is this kind of like a uh, Queen's Gambit where you trade like an important piece so that you have an even more important piece? Like it'd be Very more advantageous. Be. Yeah. Just got one guy ahead. We're gonna see a Colosseum here from Kublai Khan. And a Artemis. Is that era score, I wonder? Yeah, but also both, just very solid oneness. Mm. Lots of amenities, lots of yields. This feels very much like a SimCity dream build right here. I wonder, is Kamai going to try to comp compete for the Colosseum? Because that feels like that's an S tier wonder. He might have wanted to do that, to be honest. But uh, maybe with the production he put into Stonehenge, he could have done that instead. But it is what it is. It is what it is. Sometimes you have to make sacrifices and you can't get everything that you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amenity is super important though. Especially on like like smaller maps like these. Also in duels, but 2v2 also only has two continents in total. And you might be denied access to one of them entirely. More settlers coming out for Simon. He seems to know that he needs to catch up on cities. Let's have a look at his sim right here. He's definitely the weakest on sim. Only 40 production compared to the 50 of Korea, 70 of Kublai. Although Kamai is more than making up for that with a solid 80 production in the bank. Look at the science of Korea though. It's actually the lowest in the game right now because of what Fish did here. Yep, that's super baffling and like... To, uh, a super baffling position to be in to be lowest science in the game as like a science sieve mm -hmm. like he's definitely done something we will have to see whether it's good enough it seems theoretically he should actually have more science long term as well like Korea will take some time to actually get the mines improved around the sail ones because they do get one extra science from two mines adjacent to it so it will take a while for these same ones to actually be better than the campuses that Fish has all right now as well. That is true. But when those when those get up, it's going to be like super powerful. Do they still get the plus one food on the farms? That as well, yes. You could be a farmer. You could put a sea one on one hill and just have flatland around it. Mm, that sounds like a really fun way to play. 
<laughs> I mean, it's counterintuitive because the farms get adjacency from being next to other farms, and if there's like one tile in the middle that's not a farm, then it's like, what are you doing? <laughs> True. Yeah, you can do some fun stuff with it anyways. Looks like he's looking for a kill here. The first move going through though. And he gets the promotion off. He's very, very carefully conserving his horsemen on this front line and their HP. Yeah, keeping his units alive. Does the um does the Sayawan still negative have a negative from being adjacent to other districts in this mod? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can see it has only one adjacency right here. Ooh. You can see it's next to the encampment. I mean, the government plaza doesn't do anything. It gives minus one, but also plus one. Oh, wait, so the Saya one is now only plus two base adjacency? Yeah. And then it gets one adjacency from every two mines that are around it. Ouch. Well, you can still, like, on average, like, you, you're still going to have a much bigger science game on Korea than on other serves. But it takes a while to get up. Yep. But uh, if you put it uh, next to six hills around it, like, you have uh, what, uh, a plus five campus as well. That's pretty consistent. Based. I mean, it's a surf that you want to play ideally on like something like Highlands, maybe. But yeah, it has its place. Yeah, I think Highlands would be ideal because just the sheer amount of hills means you're going to get a really high average campus. Um, Hanging Gardens coming out from Kamai. He is going full sim, full growth. He's already earned... 47 culture per turn, really, really strong there. Although not quite as strong as Kublai on the science front. Mm -hmm. What do you think about production. the... Sorry, sorry. What do you think about the trajectory of the Kamai Empire here? I mean, he's setting up himself really well for whatever he wants to do in the late game. But he is getting Kiatis down. Might indicate <clears throat> that he's either aiming to actually close the game out with a CV, catch one, or to actually just aim out for like fast fascism. Right. Over, over like actual tax. I think that makes sense. Fascism is one of those um, civics that if you can get to it, um, the plus five combat strength, the 50% production towards the units, it just gives you such an explosive late game. Very true. Also, though, if you are fighting into a choke, like if you look at like the land between maybe Korea and Mongolia, if you just put like five planes down there, <laughs> fascism doesn't have you, right? Yep, yep. A lot of horses here in bad shape and it looks like very slowly Grand Columbia, despite the fact that he has less, oh, he actually has a unit advantage now. He's pushing back these Korean units. The Sia one's still not repaired. It looks so sad. I think that thing is going to be broken for the rest of the game unless he can push the front line back to this this choke point here but with this campus coming up pushing back to this choke point is going to be painful i can't help but feel and i know i don't like to criticize players usually but i can't help but feel that this this say one placement is a blunder <laughs> and it's going to come back to bite him in the bum it really has been so far it did discount the discountment though it wasn't entirely useless that's true, it did give him the discounted encampment, which did get him a great general, which is keeping him in the fight. It is a culture bomb. True. That as well. Oh, the horseman gets out. The click speed. Oh, so far. This is the Civ 6 RNG on combat right here. Yeah. Jesus, did you see that sequence of moves right there? Yeah, and it's Columbia, so you can promote and also attack the same turn. That's Another insane. War bonus that isn't like entirely obvious how good it is, but in some situations it makes such a huge difference. That was insane right there. Let's take a look at the era scores. We are seeing the era tick over eight turns from now. Looks like Kamai potentially Golden Age secured here. Only six points left, possibly some wonders in production, depending. Um, I don't see any wonders. Everyone else, though, is still in Dark Age territory with only eight turns to go. Yeah, it's very scary. It's also surprising for Kublai Mongolia, to be honest. Like, he had the Colosseum, he had the Artemis. He can make an Ordu, he can get his UU. Well, also, not... plus for theater. Yeah, plus four theater is here, but I'm not seeing an encampment down for the Ordu, and I'm also not seeing tech, maybe? 
He's researching masonry. I don't think he's going to be able to get to Keshig. We will see how he does. This is game two, yes. Step six is not yes now. I mean, it, it kind of feels like it, to be honest, if you actually end up playing one of these games. Turns um, by so quick. Turns do go by super fast, but I love it. I love the pace. I, I, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Mm. Sorry, I'm having a hard time thinking. I've lost my concentration. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really sorry. Yeah. I keep losing my train of thought. I think that's it sounds like it's almost dinner time, potato. Yeah. Well, during the break, I ran downstairs and I like shoveled like a handful of food, like peanuts into my mouth, but. <laughs> oh no. Let's get this guy a real dinner. <sighs> Donate now, feed mm. me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can call for a quick dinner break. Nah, we should be fine. <laughs> oh, huge flood in this city. Oh, it didn't damage it. Did they take away floods damaging cities? No, it can still happen. Ooh. What has been taken away, though, is uh, losing settlers and civilians to volcano explosions and to floods and that kind of stuff. Based. Did you hear that, guys? If you want to never lose a civilian unit to a goddamn random event ever again, install BBG. I mean, it's, it's such a change that has happened like two years ago now as well. <laughs> like it's been part of this forever. It's just <laughs> games end for no reason. Games are ruined for no reason. I think that is that is the kind of RNG I hate. I hate it when a game is decided or ended by RNG. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's just that it's bad, Angie. What do you think? <laughs> it's better, RNG. How do you no, mean? No, it's, it's, it's bad, Angie. Good, Angie is good. Bad, Angie is bad. Bad for you, I mean. Oh, right, 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 right. No, all RNG is good in my, in my book. The more random a game is, the better the game is. You know what? I would agree with that. I feel like my favorite games are the ones where someone claws back from a position that's disadvantaged. Based. Based. Um, I don't know. I just really enjoy when... Maybe this is just a single player mentality. When you get like either a really bad spawn or you get like a really kind of mid spawn that's kind of blurst. Like you've got like a really cool natural wonder but you're on like Tundra. Um, three settlers coming out here from China, or sorry, not China, uh, Mongolia. It looks like I keep Kublai Khan always mixes me up. He is going super wide. He's already on one, two, three, four, five cities, going to eight cities. Is this what you would expect for a big old sim build? Yes. Mm, if he actually manages to set these city, settle these cities in the Colosseum range, yeah, it's good. All right, let's let's let's. Mark out the Colosseum rates. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, yeah. Oh, he can get at least two more inside that. Three if he decides to settle off of freshwater. We will see what he prioritizes. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what I would pick. Getting a monument on turn one plus two amenities in a city? That seems so good. Yeah. Or actually growing. Which one will it be? Yeah, true. Uh, looks like there has been a little bit of a pushback in the center of the map. The Grand Colombian player, Task Force, has kind of run... Out, well, I wouldn't say he's run out of steam. It's just like, these are two like heavyweights, right? They're slugging each other out. They're waiting for the other one to get tired. Neither one fully committing to the war, trying to like sim, building up a bit of e economy, while also trying to maintain the front line. Three swordsmen coming out for... Grand Columbia here. Why Why the swordsman switch from horsemen? How many horses do they have on the team? Go to the army tab. It might just be a strategics issue. If you go to the army tab at the very bottom, you'll be able to see how many horses. Yeah, they've got no horses. They are totally they out of horses. They're totally out. But I'm also curious how, like, so sometimes people say, oh, you know, this guy just spawned with more strategics than me and my land. But I'm also curious how many horses were built by each team and how many horses they lost. 
because mm. I think sometimes war, especially in these situations, just comes down to how efficient you are with your unit. So if you can, each horse that you can kill of the opponent is just strategics down, right? There's stuff they're never going to get back. So I, I wonder, I wish we could see those stats here. I think what might also be happening is that uh, Fish might realize that his opportunity to actually make plays with just more maneuverability is like over because there's a line of unit now, right? Like having these more maneuverable horses doesn't actually help you at all. Yes, because the choke the point is so thin and it's all mm -hmm. harsh terrain. The swords are just generally better, maybe. Like, they also have some longevity against the Habashas later on. They could be men at arms, they could be masked men. That's true. That's actually a really good point. The Like, if they get the tortoise promotion, they can tank quite well. Although, I, having said that, dude, if Korea gets the Huachas this game, I feel like that's a come to Jesus moment for like Gran Colombia. It's going to be terrifying. It is, yeah. And it's not even like a victor on the front line, it's just a Pingala. Oh, yeah, that's a little scary. That is true. Horses are pre-builds for his unique unit. But here's the question. Is he going to get to his unique unit before these Hoaches hit? I don't I think it's going to be a bit of a gap here. I mean, technically, he is slightly ahead on the science front from Korea, but we're talking on the order of like a turn of science. That's not really enough to be able to jump a unit upgrade. I mean, also the Colombian U has like a clear purpose as well as a cavalry unit. It's something that you want to like attack with over like a distance that you want to swing around, maybe through the side. Yeah. You want to pillage, you want to like maybe snipe a city in the back. This is not what he's really looking for in this fight, I don't think. No. I think for this kind of a fight, you want to have crossbows, you want to have tortoise uh, swordsman you want to have like a solid wall that you I mean, can just grind each other down with the line infantry on the other hand that could be like interesting yeah that's true line infantry is quite powerful if especially if he can find the niter and get it improved mm -hmm. <clears throat> we are starting to see the little bit of coastal trade by the way um between grand columbia and kamai it will be up able to upgrade a lot more than the other team i think yeah Two turns until the era ticks over and we're also seeing Oracle and Mahabodhi Temple come out of the Kamai. He's more than secured a Golden Age. So is he just stealing these, trying to steal them from another player? He might actually want to delay them so that they get, he gets Era Scar for the next stage from them now. Mm, maybe. Oh, is, it the next, is it next turn already for the Golden Age? It's uh, two turns until the Golden Age. <clears throat> I think I would delay them, honestly, <laughs> to get them for the next stage. But like, let's say hypothetically, your enemy was building them and you wanted to deny them. Would you let them finish? I mean, uh, yeah, but like, you can, it's a 2v2. You can, you can like see, you can guess what people are doing. Like, you don't have to. Yeah. I have a question. How common it? in single player, how common is a diplomatic victory? Um, Like from the AI? Or from you? Um, It's very rare. It's something that I only go, like, I go for instead of other victories, and I do it at the start of the game. I'm like, I'm going to go Diplo this time. But when, ah. I, but when I do, I do tend to get all the wonders that give Diplo victory points. How interesting do you think Diplo is? I think when I first saw a Diplomatic Victory, I thought it was one of the least interesting victory types. However... I think nowadays, be because it weaves so interestingly, right, you can do a really interesting faith opener, get the Mahabodhi Temple, and then you can weave that into a wonder build in the mid game with the Statue of Liberty. And then when you get to the ultra late game, you weave that in with a um, with an industrial zone and commercial hub push and do the carbon recapture project. And you can do all sorts of like interesting things in single player. I think it's like a... It's a weird but interesting victory condition, but I still think it's my least favorite one. What about you guys? I mean, from like pure gameplay point of view, it's like you're not really doing anything, are you? Like you're not making war moves, <laughs> you're not trying to compete for great works. But during the Congress itself, there's actually a lot of mind games going on between teams. In what yes. To for. Like our Civ World Cup Finals, one of our games was entirely decided on that alone, on those mind games. It was actually kind of fun. 
I like I the also, mind games. I also like that it's like it's a bit of an equalizer. So one team could be winning in every single way, or they can have one player that's really, really big. And then usually, you know, you'd use some sort of slingshot strategy to get a really big player. But if the other team has four solid players and they're thinking about all the wonders, they can still swipe a Diplo victory right out from underneath the nose of the bigger team. And that's very exciting to watch. Yes, I think the most exciting victories are ones where someone comes back from behind, like being behind. Yeah, and a Diplo victory lets you do that because you don't necessarily need to have the most science or culture in the game to win a Diplo win. You do need some things though to actually get the wonders in time and to have enough production and that kind of stuff. Yeah, or you just need the other team sleeping <laughs> <laughs> exactly. and forgetting to go for it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's interesting how different our points of view are, to be honest. Like, the, the carbon capture and that kind of stuff never plays a role in multiplayer. It's actually, like, maybe like a part of the game that's missed entirely. Okay, so World Congress requires me to message Malm. Did we not make it to Congress last game? <laughs> I don't we think did we not. Did. <laughs> so I don't know oh how to God. vote. <laughs> uh, we just talk with the other guy. We're probably voting B. He votes A. Good day. <laughs> All right, so I think we go A for everything. Yes. Uh, so if you go to the screen. Preserve. That makes sense. Uh, Preserve vote. makes sense. Let me see, what else did he say? Preserve me, me. Okay. Preserve mal, mom. Perfect. Um, Preserve mom and mom. Done. Well, now would be the time to go grab some food. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Good day, sir. It's fun to roleplay. I've always liked... Um, there was these... Back in the day, there was like Hearts of Iron 4 roleplay games where you would like type in character as the country you were playing. So people would get like really pompous and eloquent with their like diplomatic messages like hello good people of switzerland we would like to offer you a trade deal <laughs> is that sort of like a murder mystery dinner party kind of deal but over a video game or a board game <laughs> kind of it's if if world war ii was a murder mystery <laughs> <laughs> um i actually love uh I love the idea of doing a murder mystery. Like I watched, uh, what was it? what were those two movies? Oh my god, Glass Onion and why do I want to say Clockwork Orange? It was Knives Out. Knives, Knives Out. Knives Out. Out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Super fun mystery films. Really makes me want so, to do a murder mystery night. Oh, uh, we should. You should. It's really fun. You can get like the little box sets of the murder mysteries that are really fun. You can get them at most. Um, like vintage stores or antique stores, because once people do them once, they're probably not going to host another one that's exactly the same, right? So you can get them for really cheap. That's true, actually. You can get them secondhand probably real easy. Yeah. I think it would be really fun to like, I'm not a super crafty person, like as in I don't, I'm not artsy and I don't make many things, but I think it would be really fun to like custom make your own murder mystery. Ooh, what would the theme be? Um... Besides Ooh. the murder. Um, well, I'd say the second theme would be mystery. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Good that we got those out of the way. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of a good theme here. I think it could be like... So there's like a couple that come to mind that could be like really funky depending on how you do it. Like you could do a superhero murder mystery. Like one, a superhero has been murdered. 
Ooh. And there's a whole bunch of like evidence that points to like a variety of different people who did it. Like maybe there's ice on the walls. Ice Man did it. Ooh, yes. I love that idea. I'm getting Batman vibes from that. Yes. Or um, you could do I like the idea of maybe like a Dungeons and Dragons murder mystery. Like you have to figure out which class like committed the murder. It's like we found a holy symbol by the body. Was it planted there? You know. Ooh. Um, but other, otherwise you could do like you could do fun like movies like you could do a Nightmare Before Christmas themed one like Oogie Boogie killed uh, Jack in the dining room. <laughs> I like how all of my examples were like really <laughs> just odd. <laughs> no, they were all. I, I like. I like that we're leaning into the superhero vibe. I would. I. I think that would be a fun one to dress for. See, that's like that's when I think of murder mystery parties. That's always the first thing that I think about. Like, what would be a fun thing to put on some costumes for, and one where I can theme some food and beverages. So that's. I true. would love showing up as like poison ivy or something to this uh we could do like a gotham themed dinner we could have a bunch of different uh snacks and drinks around every superhero here's the problem the, i feel like every gotham based murder mystery it's gonna be the joker of course it's the joker do you know what i mean <laughs> and if it's not the joker it's someone working for the joker <laughs> Okay, you have me there. It, it is always the joke. Now, the real twist would be to play off the fact that Batman doesn't kill anyone, but have all the evidence point to Batman. Mm. <laughs> or what if the Joker was the one murdered? Ooh. And, oh, shit, that's actually such a good idea. Oh, my God. Penguin fish sticks, says Donzo in chat. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Has anyone done that before? To be honest, it feels like someone should have, no? Murder mystery where the Joker was murdered. Well, sounds like we can be the first to host it. Hundred percent. Now, if only I had friends. Now, potato, you just need to book <laughs> your flight to New York, and we would be happy to host a Batman murder mystery. Where you can choose to be any superhero you want. <laughs> Based. Or you could be the Joker. And be dead. Yeah. <laughs> that would be a good twist if it's the Joker that murdered the Joker. <laughs> we can all True. go home now. Or the Joker is actually still alive. <laughs> That's the actual <laughs> mystery. <laughs> Looks like the game is picked back up here. We got our uh, oh crossbowman out. That's another step towards the Huacha. That is. But he only has three, four pre-builds. I guess five coming out shortly. What's he on? He's on military... Military engineering. Is that when you unlock the Huacha? It's night. Uh, he still needs stirrups and then musketman, I believe. Gunpowder. Mm, okay, so but he's close. He's very close. He might want to build an armory as well to get the boost. Ooh. It's a scary moment here for Grand Columbia because here's the thing. Has he held out long enough to eat, to delay a Huacha push, right? Long enough for Khmer to be have that explosive late game? He did make it so that Korea had the lowest science in the game for a while. So that was pretty successful. He did manage to squeeze out, squeeze out a lot more cities than the other guy. Uh, I think they're but... even on cities now, actually. Oh, wait, no, no, he's, he's up no. one. He's up two. No, just one, actually. Two. I think... I'm, I'm a little worried, though, because his, his culture sim is really behind Korea's. I mean, it's not good on both sides. <laughs> no. But this is kind of what happens in a 2v2, right? If two players spawn next to each other, they kind of have to fight, like, a little bit. <clears throat> they could do a gentleman handshake and just don't touch each other at all. Yeah, I feel like that's going to devolve into a bloodbath too quickly. 
That would only happen if they were two French players in an international team. <laughs> True. Hmm. This is stressful. I'm stressed just watching this. I would not enjoy this position at all. It is very... Columbia's threat. Yeah, both of them. They're really? both stressed. I feel like Korea is looking forward to this timing, honestly enough. I mean, he might be a little bit scared about, like, not stressed about pulling it off correctly. But he can do a lot now, yeah. I think. I think so. The thing I'm really scared about is while I like the position that Korea is in, right, for the Huacha, when he when he gets those going, he's going to be explosive. It's going to be amazing. My worry is that Kamai Sim, oh my God, lots are happening here. Kamai Sim is kind of nutty right now, right? He's up uh, 40 production over Kublai and like 100 faith per turn. Yeah. Really scary. That's terrifying. That's Korea this just... is what I meant, though, when I said that I feel like out of the two sieves that you could be chilling with back line. I mean, you also have to consider that Noob634 is on an island, sort of. He's very limited in space. The other team has more than half the map, but I think Kamaya is just a better sieve to be left alone and sim in the corner. I would agree. What is actually also, like conflicting about these sort of scenarios where you have two people on the front line rallying each other with a person swimming behind. Even if you win your 1v1 and you start attacking cities, if the other guy behind just comes through and liberates them, then what have you actually gained? You've just fed a bunch of Diplo favor. Sure. It might actually feel like a little bit defeatist to think about it this way. Maybe. Although, having said that, I actually love Kublai's sim right now. I mean, like, just look at his yeah. land. It's brilliant, yeah. I think he did about as well as he could have, yeah. Like, he's got an amazing Colosseum. He's got amphitheaters coming up. He's got harbors coming up. He's got commercial hubs coming up. He's even popping out a couple of horsemen. I wonder if that horseman's for error score, actually. Why would he? It might well be. <laughs> yeah. Is that for cavalry pre-builds? Like, what? <laughs> Relobby? Actually, we could be going for cavalry. Oh, that wait, wait, wait. The age has passed, right? We got a golden age on the free summers. We got a normal age on Simon. The dark age on Korea. What are they doing? They're relobbying? Relobbying. Maybe if someone's hotkeys aren't working. Oh, that's so annoying. Sometimes spamming escape fixes it. Oh, that's interesting. I should try that. I sometimes How do you win though? If you're if you're at Kublai Mongolia here, you're sitting here looking at the enemy with so many more cities, so much more land. What do you do? What do you even try for? Um, I suppose you hope that you kill Grand Columbia, take his score out of the game, and then just try to hold off Kamai until turn 130. Yeah, actually, that's a good point. That's what I would be thinking if I was in their shoes. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe deny Anchor Watt for the real score, cheese. Drop the link again. Based, corny. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Appreciate it. No worries. We will check the fully evangelized religion of Kamai in a moment here um, when we're back in the game. Yeah, it's going to be interesting what people actually think their win condition would be this game. Kamea made in a... We should check Congress, by the way, as soon as it happens. Oh, right. We forgot okay. to check what the result was. I See, I'm a, see. this is why I'm a, I'm a newbie caster, okay? I don't know all the stuff to check. But Kamea had a, like a play already, was you were talking about earlier as well, with the Mahabodhi. They finished that. Getting two Diplo points already from the Wonder. Yes. So do you think Kamai are setting up for a culture victory or for a Diplo? I mean, they can easily threaten both, probably. They have mm. the advantage on the router, they have the Oracle. Interesting. I don't think Kublai actually has a single theater up already. Well, actually he does one, I think, or two. 
Yes, I think he was getting an amphitheater out. That would actually be something we should check. We should check great people. We should check the World Congress. We should check Kamai's religion. This kind of breaks sometimes like it. It, yes, it's true. That is uh, that is the one thing about the pace of the game, is that sometimes like the longer pace games are nice because you can actually check all the info, whereas here, like the, the lightning pace is kind of hard to keep up with everything. That's true. It's hard to do it. I think this is why it's nice when you have two casters talking to each other because then you can each be checking different things. Yes. And plus, it's good to have like experienced players who can like point out things to me that I'll miss. <laughs> So that's why I appreciate both you guys being here. But it looks like fully evangelized Confucianism uh, is the stupa for the plus one amenity and crusade for plus five combat threat near foreign Ooh. cities. Well, crusade is interesting in this situation too because he can easily convert <clears throat> uh, task force vicious cities. Yes, already. And then he has, and he can he can park his units inside of Charlie, for instance, and they'll get plus five against anything the other team throws their way. Right, because it's foreign cities, not enemy not cities. Right. That's really so powerful. Is, yeah, so this is actually a really good religion for situations like this where <clears> you anticipate you'll need to protect someone else. I'm That's... unsure whether Phyrexus ever intended to be used this way. <laughs> hey, listen. <laughs> it works, it works. Um, <laughs> let's, check, let's check the diplo. Oh, no buildings can be created in city center, so no more walls. No walls. That's probably Ooh. what Korea wanted for his Watcher push. That but is it, correct. They both voted for that. I'm surprised. Are they not allowed to exchange Diplo favor before a vote? Oh, they can. They can. But like, as you said, the timer makes it really tough. <laughs> mm. um, we also have a border control treaty. So Jaya Varman's borders will not grow via culture. Now, that's probably not the end of the world for him because I think he does have culture bombs, doesn't he? On his holy sites. He does. It's not the uh, end of the world, no, but no, it's no. still annoying. Did they, they take that away in the latest? They episode? did take that away from Khmer a while ago as well. Oh, okay, fair. I'm not sure if that was actually warranted, but it is what it is. And, and it, looks, I, it like... looks like, yeah, it looks like team under the gun have gone for the heavy into this uh, Diplo victory. Yeah, they're definitely trying to threaten it. Mm -hmm. If I check the diplomatic victory here, you can see under the gun already up to five out of 20 points. There's a lot of points still on the table. Statues and a Statue of Liberty will get him to nine. One Another Congress might get him to 11. He can get there pretty quick, I think. He did. That was the first World Congress to get five points in the first one. That's going to be pretty yeah. scary for the other team. Well. Yeah. Um, in terms of, there was something else we were meant to check, wasn't there? Uh, what else did we want to check again? Religion we did, Congress we did, Double Points we did as well. The, the theaters, the writers? Oh, that's right. Great people. Let's have a look. So, lots of great merchants going to Kublai Khan, as you would expect. One great writer going to Kamai, and that's the only one that's gone so far. And it doesn't look like... It is actually interesting that uh, Kublai Mongolia got all these merchants because he did commit to harvest. Yes, he, but do you know why? Do you know why Mongolia got all the merchants? He's, I saw him running projects, yeah. Yeah, it's because Noob634 is the greatest Mali player in the world and this is his his uh, this is his thing. <laughs> I think he's cosplaying Mali. <laughs> really? Because I thought he only ever built like one commercial hub and he just project yeah and he's just been chopping projects out of that one commercial hub city mm -hmm. i swear that's what's going on <laughs> that's insane it's brilliant he, he's getting he's getting all of the merchants that's like plus one trader an extra yeah. luxury gold yeah he's gonna get this trader merchant and the next one and with luck he'll also get the faith one. Oh, that would be huge if he gave that one to Kamai actually also, Maniac is, is chiming in to remind us that Statue is now only three points, not four. They nerfed it. Okay, interesting. Uh, in other news, uh, Armory coming out for Korea, so we're about to see the Huacha push. It's like almost time. Oh, it's coming. Yeah. Four turns, exactly. It should be. <clears throat> and he's getting some melee units behind. I uh, know melee units, but knights. He will upgrade. 
Yeah, we're gonna have to spend a lot of good on this though. It's gonna be expensive. Let's have a look. So they're making combined together 111 gold per, 113 Ooh. gold per turn, and they do have a lot of gold banked. So there is potential here if they do have the half price card. I think they can upgrade at least the majority of this army. Yeah, maybe. I mean, what do you expect this to cost? It's probably going to be over a thousand, right? Oh yeah, easily. I think in standard speed, to upgrade to a crossbowman is like 250. So I don't even mm. know how much it is to a Hawacha. I mean, it's crossbows to Hawachas, but yeah, it's it's rough. <laughs> um, oh, we're seeing our first man at arms on the border with Charlie. He knows the watch is coming, right? So he's getting yeah. ready. Wait, did we not? I, I, I tuned out a little bit. We, we checked that total gold accumulated over the entirety of the game, not the bank gold. Oh, sorry, you're right. He's, they've only got like 300 banked. Yeah, yeah. 450 banked. So they'll be able to upgrade some of them. Sorry. He's saving. I mean, he's accumulating much faster than the other team can. They might be also chopping copper and mazes right now, if they can. Let's have a look around. Do we see any copper choppers? I think there was a maze here. <laughs> any crabs? <laughs> Not anymore. It's all top. Any crabs in the chat? And interestingly <laughs> enough, there's a lot of horses coming out as well. Yeah, Google. I wonder why. He's getting ready to make a play already with like courses and intel, I believe. Uh -huh. Ooh. Smart. Ooh. Like he, he doesn't want to wait late game for like cavalry or helicopters. He wants to do something now. Dude, look at the government plaza. He has the sp uh, the spy building one turn from finishing. Oh, no, no, he's building it. Sorry. <laughs> I was like, I thought he was doing like a giga head play where he was like leaving it one turn from finishing. Um, but yeah, he's going for the intelligence agency, so I think you're right. I think it's going to be coursers plus a spy. Ooh. It's going to be interesting how he actually finds his way to have some impact with that. I th I think, like... It looks uh, like he wants to swim up top. The merchant has scouted the way already. <laughs> hmm. It's not Landa his, actually. He might be looking to upgrade in that territory if it doesn't die right here. Yeah. It belongs to Noob, which is Kublai, so I think, yeah, I, and I think actually Grand Columbia is looking to maybe try to kill this, or at least pillage it. Yeah, but mm -hmm. he's distracted now. Like, actually, this is not really good for him to be doing this right now. Like, he needs all his units down there. So here's a question, and I've always wondered this myself when I'm in these situations. If you are Grand Columbia staring down all these Watcher pre-builds, do you go in now before he has the tech? to try to weaken or kill as many of the crossbows as you can. You don't want to wait, right, for him to upgrade? Mm, yeah, but you are fighting crossbows with crossbows. You still have to try to take a, at least decent enough trade, right? Yeah. I suppose for me it would come down to, do I feel like my teammate... How many, te how many turns does my teammate need? Because I feel like if I defend, I can buy more time for him. But if I attack... Um, I burn down the clock quicker. Hmm. Very true. Very true. I mean, he's never truth. going to like fully die, right? He's sitting in Bravo and Delta behind chokes. Yes, but if I was Grand Columbia, I would probably be thinking about a cockroach settler. Mm-hmm. It's going to be rough. Like, I feel like we can assume that Charlie is going to die at least for sure. But, uh, really so I feel like we're not getting fish in his excellent war moves enough credit. Well, we will see. We will see. I think it should die at least. Oh, I don't know. Can you defend if he has a great general for these watches? Can you defend that? Uh, how how close is fish to muskets? Uh, let's have a look. Text. So fish is working on printing. So. Probably Ooh, not, not close. close. Let me not see. Does he have a pasture? His pastures only have one food. No stirrups. No stirrups. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's that's rough. But Korea oh. will have to make the choice whether he actually wants to keep the city and open himself up to liberate, or whether he wants to. Oh, looks like someone crashed. 
or whether he wants to just raise it. He he uh, he pulled out his internet cable, the old classic <laughs> internet toggle. When you when you're losing a game, you just pull the cable. The game registers <laughs> as a disconnect, not a loss. <laughs> Starcraft one players will relate. <clears throat> it was always really suspicious. Um, when you like loaded into a Starcraft one lobby and you would see someone and they would have like one ten games lost zero and then like disconnected twice and you're like yo bro do you disc and they're like no 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 no. I totally don't and then you get halfway through the game and you blow up one of their bases and it's like oh player has disconnected you fucking asshole <laughs> <laughs> all right I guess we're gonna re lobby here yeah. Yeah, I've heard some wild excuses over the years from people who are just trying to get out of bad, uh -huh. uh, bad situations. Gotta go, I've my dog's some, on fire. <laughs> got some wild excuses from you. What? <laughs> That's not true. I just rage quit and I fully admit it. I tell everyone I'm not coming back because I've had enough of my bad position. <laughs> <laughs> Continue without me. There's no need to wait for the, the customary 15 minutes. <laughs> Faced. <laughs> I don't think I would have the constitution to be forced to stay in a game I'm really not happy with. I'd be like, please just yeah. sub, sub me out, dude. Get a sub. Yeah, it's very relatable. Like, especially if the game draws out for like another hour or two. Look, there's no need to lie about bad behavior. <laughs> I'm still waiting for the new lobby. A new lobby. What's your favorite sieve potato? Ashton Rucker. Thank you so much for asking. I really appreciate that. My favorite sieve is Kamai because I like big old faith yields and I like sieves that scale based on their population. Um, come on, guys. Throw some questions at us. Let's let's get some energy in the chat. Uh, what if the commercial get for you? What are your favorite excuses for quitting a sieve game? My dog's on fire is excellent. <laughs> um, ooh, I feel like a really good one is like a mild illness is like flaring up sorry guys like my sciatica or something you know like something <laughs> is sciatica mild? I actually don't know this I don't is know it should be the same link though you know I would use hiccups I have a really bad case of persistent hiccups and I just can't move my... I can't make my war move. So, the the problem with the I'm about to shit myself sorry excuse is you can only use that so many times before it becomes like, okay, you should go see a doctor. <laughs> like, I don't know, you've got like uh, irritable bowel or you've got like, you know, colonitis or something. You need to sort that out. Yeah, but then you, you know, you've got another baked in excuse, Potato. You have at least one more excuse where you have to go for the doctor's appointment. And then perhaps at least two more times for follow-up tests. Mm, true. Can really milk it. I <laughs> think. <laughs> I think we're the looking, We're not looking for convincing excuses now. We're just looking for the, the more outrageous ones. True. I think. I think the most convincing one is. Sorry, I just got a phone call. Family emergency, and then you just leave. Because <laughs> oh, <laughs> that one can't be questioned. You can't do it very often, but it, you. Pe no one's going to question you on that. <laughs> Unless you like immediately go offline, like offline on Steam, and then like, oh, where did those ten hours playing War Thunder come from, Potato? <laughs> there is the story from like 2019 or something like this when someone quit an FFA and CPL, and their excuse was that the house was on fire, but then they actually proved it with like a news article. <laughs> <laughs> that's dedication that's dedication i can't believe they wrote a fake news article about their house being <laughs> that reminds me of uh me and my brother used to play anarchy online it was like an early mmo and uh, one of my friends one of my brother's friends was from romania uh and one day he just sends my brother a message like hey 
they were like they were chatting about something in the game you know people talking talking nonsense i just goes uh, brb house on fire and we never heard from him again so <laughs> i'm like <Whoa>. Jesus. <laughs> i hope dark. i hope that guy would just like realize that mmos were a waste of his time <laughs> Maybe he just had to, maybe his computer also burned down in the fire and he's been diligently saving up for a new one. Waiting I think, for the day he can see his friends again. I think that's what happened. I think we did eventually hear from, again, from him again. I just, I don't think I was ever told about it, but I remember that time. <clears throat> that's crazy. Wait, there was another good one in the chat. Hold on. Oh, wife is yelling at me for gaming too long. This is extra convincing because sometimes you can even hear the wife in the background of the mic. <laughs> oh, if you get a really conv like if your wife is a good like voice actor, get her to like actually yell. If you're on voice, be like, sorry, guys, I got to go. And she's just in the background like, blah, 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 blah. you gotta take out the trash. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Although I feel like that kind of like makes your wife seem like an asshole. I feel like now this might be a hot take. I don't think you should ever make your partner look bad to another person. Ooh, I like that. I don't think you should ever shit talk your partner to like your family. I don't think I don't think you should do any of that kind of stuff. I think you should be your partner's like best advocate. Oh, I like that a lot. I would agree with that. I uh, it really irks me when I see people talking like, oh, you know, I can't go because the girlfriend won't let me. And I'm like, dude, if your girlfriend actually wouldn't let you go to like a, a guy's night, like she's an asshole and. You you just don't want to go, okay? Just admit it. You don't want to go. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. People want to know if fish is in danger. Hmm. <laughs> How to answer this question? I don't see. I see. I feel like look. Just in the last few turns, you know, fish has really broken down JJJ's front line. All these got left are a few crossbows. I mean, you did damage a few of those crossbows, yeah. But, like, they don't actually have enough gold to upgrade all of this. I, I think I cut out. Do they need to upgrade all of those crossbows, though? No. Let's we'll see how it develops. Oh, there's actually... Oh, that's Kamai. I thought this was a sneaky uh, <laughs> Mongolian knight in here being annoying, but they're actually fighting Valletta. Valletta under the control of JJJ. Um, so this is actually kind of a thorn in the side of um, Echo and... Sorry, not Echo. I keep I keep reading his city names and thinking that's his player name for Task 4 and under. <laughs> Wait, I have, I have to interrupt this stream for an important announcement from the chat. The medical guy here, Skyatica, can be mild or an emergency and anywhere in between. It's a garbage bag term for a pinched nerve. Anywhere from the spine to the buttock to the back of the leg. Good to know. All right, well, oh, Hawacha time. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight Hawachas. Oh. I think Fish might be having one of those conditions right now. Monka S. <laughs> Can we get you know some Monka what? S's in chat, please? <clears throat> if this if this works, Noob634 is this game's MVP. For upgrading this many watches. Kind of true. true. Like, that was a lot of money. And he's upgrading coursers in the ocean right now. Three. It's going to be a big play as well. But it's going to be a big play in 20 turns. <laughs> <laughs> the horses are coming. He's going to upgrade even more. Another Hawacha. Where are they getting the money for this? Noob 64. Maze. People are saying the Huacha upgrades from the crossbow and fairly cheaply. I'm going to check that right yeah, now. Yeah, but it wasn't just that alone. There were also a lot of heavy chariots <laughs> into knights. Yeah, a lot of, lot of knights, a lot of coursers. I guess it is only like, yeah. So crossbows are 180. How much was the Huacha? 250. Yeah, it's actually less mm. than the distance. It should be cheaper than Archer to Crossbow, actually. Oh, fair enough. Well, Archer to Crossbow is heckin' expensive. It's like 60 gold. I think it's... Is it 250 base? And then when you half mm -hmm. it, it should be 60. Because it gets halved twice because of online speed. 
Yeah, it's 150, uh, 125 to hard upgrade it, and I guess 60 gold to do it. Cut. Was it 120? I guess it's 120. I think it is. I, I don't know. I don't play online that much. I haven't played Korea on online speed. Uh, looks like Nalanda's days are numbered here. Two swordsmen and two catapults here chipping away. But will these coursers make it in time to save the city? It looks like he's trying to inch his way forward so as not to get spotted. Yeah. This is interesting. He might reveal this. Uh, he might save the city, but he's also revealing this play. Ooh, he's actually standing literally on the edge of his vision here. Now, is this just like really experienced play that he knows what Grand Columbia can see? Yes, I think so. <laughs> I think he just used up all his movement points, to be honest. <laughs> Oh, he did just use up all his movement because that's crazy. If this was like intentional, that he was like trying to save it so he couldn't be seen. I mean, he, he can't know that there's a builder there on the tower. The builder's granting the vision with the Columbia ability of X Division. Mm. It's not. It's not the borders. Uh... Oh, it's not the borders. Okay, okay. True. A new front line has appeared. We've got a couple of knights. And the watches are firing towards the end of the turn. Are you able to go to Fish's vision if you click on Charlie? I wonder if they see the coursers. Do they have a spy on Korea? They do not have a spy on Korea yet. In fact, he's only just now getting his intelligence agency out. It's two turns away. Okay. And they don't see a single Mongolian city. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, Khmer went for the Grandmaster's Chapel, which seems like a very natural move for them. Yeah, yeah. of course. I mean, building the spy with the card is also always going to be cheaper than building um, the... What is it called again? <laughs> Intelligence agency. Intelligence, yep. These watches do slap. They do. I will say this, though. If you're under, you're looking at noobs' military strength climb up here, I feel. Mm-hmm. Like, he does have the better sim right now, theoretically. But if this just steamrolls through... It's very scary for him as well. A lot of units getting traded back and forth here. A couple of knights going down, a couple of swordsmen going down. But I feel like... <clears throat> could we go to the yield tab? I'm curious what the GPT looks like. Sure thing. I would say GPT is definitely in favor of Kublai. Yeah. Only by a little bit, though. I mean, if there was a really big difference, then the trading would work out in favor of the team with more gold, right? Because they can mm. easily resupply. For sure. How is Korea's sim? Or is not Korea, Khmer's sim. Wait, why did he settle all the way down here? Was this for extra luxuries? Is this a continent split? Oh, Could I mean, be, yeah. silver. It's good. Yeah. There's silver over here. <laughs> It's not a split though. But does he not have any silver on his own? I mean, there's a silver there, yes. But he knows at this point that Kublai is coastal and privateers can come through and pillage all of this. Mm. I think he actually improving those tiles down the coast might have been a mistake already. These. Well, I suppose this is so few tiles that's not the end of the world. Like, if you invest into privateers and get three tile pillages, that doesn't feel like a huge win. No, it is not, but I mean, I guess this game could to theoretically go to nukes and then you do need like a privateer class unit to upgrade your nuclear sub. Where is Kamai's prod coming from, actually? Um, I think it's actually just from the really high population. Like if we look at the average mm -hmm. pop of his cities, um, there's a way to see pop, isn't there? Uh, I don't know. That, that was, was it Eros actually? In Eros, no. yeah. Yeah, you see, he's got 71 population compared to the 59. Ooh, true. And I feel like that, well, that's like 10, well, like 12 extra pop. If they're all working mines, that's an extra 40 production, which seems to be lined up with about how much a head he is. Man, I do love his sim right here. Mostly just because of how many builders he's built and how many tiles he's improved. Like, it's a super, super solid sim. Like, I love to see all these, like, three production tiles, four production tiles. Mm -hmm. Crazy good. True. Some of this might not be entirely optimal, of course, but you can just blame that on the timer. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
You but are fighting your timer. Say, I'm also impressed by how Mongolia is keeping pace on a sim that's not built for this kind of sim. <laughs> and with much worse land. Yeah. Would you oh, would you say so. this land is worse? Is it just because of the lack of hills? Lack of hills, awkward district placement, no mountains at all for science. Uh, it's also a little bit awkward to just walk around, right? Like you have all yeah. of these lakes, you're just walking one tile a turn as well. At the very least, there are maybe like a few reefs here and there, but yeah, it's really awkward campus and stuff. But let's let's check out the war because I feel like uh, Charlie is getting pushed here. And no walls because of the city center disabled as well. Really rough. <laughs> That's huge. It's Forcers huge. at Delta are in. They are in. Yeah, this is this is a problem. <laughs> yeah, if I if I'm tasked right now. I'm if if I'm fish rather I'm I'm begging for help. I'm like, dude, you gotta send something to me. Help! <laughs> I'm dying here. Something. God, ah, oh, there's so many units dying. This man at arms is also toast next turn. I think. And it's like I've got a slinger in the night. I can help you. <laughs> <laughs> nope, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> You're beyond help, buddy. God, this, I mean, is... this is smart too because then they can give all of the cities to Mongolia so he can actually get big. Ooh. Do you I think that's. Try that, but I don't think it's that viable now. Like loyalty as well as part of the Maybe. game. <laughs> Maybe. But Delta's not that far from Mongolia's cities. Oh, yeah, Delta for sure. Maybe they went with Charlie. So, wait, what's, what's Kamai's win condition here? Let's have a look. Are we have we seen any culture? Ooh, culture victory in twelve turns. That's probably not true. <laughs> <laughs> That's fake. Three out of thirty-five tours. This game is over. Why are they still playing? CV is almost done. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, but I think that's viable. Like, if there's anything for him to rock band, he could definitely try for it. Do you think but... he's going to get to rock bands? 160 culture, he can be there at some point. To be honest, mm. he plays one rock band on Fisher's land and he gets all the rest he could possibly get from him. Yeah. That's Interesting. Wait, he gets all the what? Sorry? All the domestic. The way that you gain tourists, right, is uh, you, you steal domestics from other people. Yes. Right? And there's only so much like that you can gain from like one person. Like It depends how much culture they had throughout the game. That's true, and Fish hasn't had that much culture, so he doesn't have many, right? Okay, I understand. Yeah. Um, like 21 tourists is total that he could gain from his teammate. I'm very I'm very surprised that we could see rock bands here, because that's not what I was even thinking about. I mean, 160 culture, like, yeah, we can get that, to be honest. That's exciting. That's cool. But there's no one to rock band, which is definitely <laughs> unless he can sneak it into, I don't know, to Mongolia's land somehow, swim him over or something. <laughs> That'd be Find fun. Ports. <laughs> there. Oh my god. There should be. Ah uh, shit. There should be a promotion for rock bands called like underground punk band or something that makes them like undetectable. <laughs> <laughs> so that you would can... be really funny. That would be so funny. <laughs> So, it would actually be so cool to have like sort of like camouflage units that you know like like in starcraft actually with the zerg the observers we can drop yes. like a bunch of changelings i don't know if you, if you know what i'm talking about you just have like a random coaster coming from the other side and you'll be like wait this isn't my unit wait i can't click on it what is this guy doing that's what civ needs we need dark templars <laughs> <laughs> I don't um, know. I don't know. I don't really know. Like they can't really kill under the gun. I don't see them doing that this game at all. No, but they can kill his teammate. They can't though. I mean, Task Force Fish can go escape settle right behind. No. Well, if he's dying too fast, then he won't make it. Yeah. True. Is he going to cockroach, do you think? Or is he going to try and hold for a bit longer before the cockroach comes out? I feel like he should be doing both, to be honest. 
Oh yeah, he's pretty dead. Looking at the number of units down south and above, I would buy that settler right now in Foxtrot and start swimming. <laughs> yep, same. Just nestle myself somewhere up here in the tundra, pretend I'm playing Age of Empires. He <laughs> doesn't have to go to buy it though. He has to make it. Yeah, that's rough. Well, I mean, Kamai is making a lot of gold, but it's probably being pumped into units or something right now. It looks like he's finally fighting Valletta. This Valletta um, steal from JJ is super huge thorn in their side because if he could reinforce right now, he might actually be able to make a difference. But the fact that he can't get through here. Yeah. That's would huge. have been so huge to actually kill it early. I think I agree with you. Grand Colombia maybe should have gone and killed Valletta like classical era. But then again, like you have to imagine that he probably considered that and made it made a decision not to do that for a reason, right? These aren't yeah, for sure. He wanted to rest while he still could, right? Like he wanted to delay as much as possible what is happening right now. Yep. Yep. Delta is not yet under siege. And it looks like he can hold for a couple more turns. If he can get out like a pikeman or two, he might be able to kill a couple of these coursers as they slam the city. Funny how he has just been fighting that Lunda while this was happening. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's so unfortunate. The the timing of this Corsair push was actually like perfect to completely screw his Nalanda attack. It was Ooh, cheeky little kill on a Corsair here. All the Corsairs getting fortified around the city. City shots come out. Delta is now under siege. <laughs> you sound like a newscaster, Potato, and I love it. <laughs> Reporting live from Delta, where we are under <laughs> siege. <laughs> <laughs> it's my. It's all those years of watching like esports. You get the esports voice. <laughs> Fish is down to. I was actually going to say he's like down bad on army, but he's actually kind of on par. I don't know how he's holding it together here because this is like severe pressure. Yeah. I. I don't understand why he's not escaping now. Do you think he's not scared? <laughs> Maybe he sees this huge Khmer force, force coming. Oh, finally, yeah. Edmund Anki coming out, by the way. <laughs> Super late. The one tile Edmund Anki. This is like AI levels of Edmund Anki. What? Oh. I guess he's going for a golden age, maybe? <laughs> yes, there are five turns left on the era. And he is down by four points. A very late Diplo quarter too, but I guess people just deprioritize de that when there's only four city states in the game. He's he has like a very slight edge on Sim, but the worrying thing is, like you said, if Mongolia starts to get some of these Grand Colombian cities. Yeah. This synth is actually funny. Does she stream or something? She usually only streams with women. <laughs> She's a misandrist, unfortunately. And you can always catch me on Potato McWhiskey streams. <laughs> True. Especially when the plates are up. Based. Oof. Still no safety settler. He's really trusting under the gun to rescue him here. Might be just a, I got this, I got this, I got this. I don't actually got this scenario. <laughs> I think in this case, oh my god, did you see that? <laughs> Minus 100. Oh my. What was that? I missed what unit that was. I have no idea, but it died in one hit. I think it was just a crossbow. Yeah, I think he one shot a crossy. Jesus. You know what? Task Force Fish still does not have a spy out, does he? He got his intelligence agency, actually. 
So his spy is in transit, I suppose? Yes, there's his spy right there. Got it. it is now, in fact, doing a listening post. Okay, okay, perfect. Speaking why of is, which... Why are these watches hitting so hard, then? I think they just have really good base strength, like plus five from military lines, plus five from huh. great general. It's just a fiat cannon. God. These pikemen are insane, though. 67 combat strength pikemen. Pretty good. Is it oligarchic legacy? Yes. Yeah. He's got oligarchy, he's got fortified defense, ideal terrain, garrison commander, and bonus from military alliance and commandant general. He's got all the good shit. I think they're sweating a lot now. They should be. So the spy interaction, if you're running a listening post, then you get plus three military strength on your units against that person's units for having intel. If your spy is level two or higher, you get plus six. So it can make quite a difference. I mean, it's like having a great general that applies to your entire army. That's true. No matter where they are. It's pretty strong. And I think especially like we were talking about earlier with Kublai Khan's, Kublai Clan's ability to get double diplomatic visibility bonuses. Whoa, 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 whoa. Kublai Clan. <laughs> Listen, we we're getting close to something interesting. <laughs> I'm just fumbling my words, okay? Listen. Yeah. I'm not feeling so good for fish. I'm not feeling so good. This is really. This can go really quickly without walls, no? Yes. Charlie just got a Charlie horse. Uh, ooh. Still no I mean, this could be interesting. Under the Gun has a reputation for fighting it out until the bitter end. So I wonder if he would continue to 1v2 in this scenario. Would you if you were playing Kamai? I think you can try, but I think you will not try that for very long as well. Like, <laughs> sure, you can upgrade to your own field cannons, but uh, it's still a long road towards tanks for, yeah, for Khmer, Kamai. That's maybe what you need to deal with these watches. It looks like Fish is feeling the heat, needs a five minute break, probably to cool down his hands from clicking so much. <laughs> I mean, another play is that Kamai could take Valletta and give it to Fish and protect that with his entire life. That might be the play right now, yeah. I trust they will get creative and find a way for him not to full die. Mm. Mm. I mean, theoretically, if they can get enough cities from Kamai around one of his one of his enough of units from Kamai around one of his cities. Mm -hmm. But this is like now happening at rapid pace. There's no units left to stall. Mm. Congress will happen, but it's like not in time to actually build walls. <laughs> By the way. Potato, have you ever played Grounded? I see that you own the game. I have played Grounded. It's quite fun. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids vibes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We are 50 hours in right now, but we still... I don't I don't know exactly how much more of the game we have left. But it feels like we we haven't gotten to all the big boss battles yet. Really? I suppose... It Survival games can be kind of like where you spend hours and hours and hours, but you don't actually like do anything but build like really cool houses. Yes, that's exactly what we've been doing. <laughs> we did build a castle out of like a thousand mushroom bricks, yeah. Holy so, shit. Insane. That is bonkers. I think Noob has all the screenshots. I'll show them to you later if I can get them off it. But um what was your, do you remember if you had any favorite builds for your character, like weapons and armor wise? So I only played Grounded like one time, maybe twice over a weekend. And uh -huh. uh, we never got very far because we were like mm -hmm. watching TV when we were playing it. 
Um, oh, I just dropped my pen. Sorry. Um, yeah, we never got very far in it, so I never actually really got to do much of the equipment stuff. I barely even built a base in that game. I see. Well, I, I have a feeling I'm going to be starting another run shortly after this one. So if you want in, just let me know. It's so fun. I love base building games. They're really fun. I do love base building games. The only trouble is you're in America and I'm in Europe. So the time zoning is going to be tough. That's true. You have to be a big night owl if you want a game with me. <laughs> yes, and I am no longer a teenager, so night owling is something that comes with massive repercussions. <laughs> <laughs> I could definitely identify with that. I the, My favorite thing about playing video games with people in Europe is that I can be asleep in bed, all tucked in, teeth brushed, night cream on by 10 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you should get up really early to play with me how about that i I'll... could do that i could be up okay. <laughs> i'd also have to get up stupid early <laughs> um i don't think that would actually work though because if there's a six hour difference like noon would be 6 a.m yeah i don't think that would work it only works the other way unfortunately why is that um because if you had to get up super early you would have to you would have to go to bed at like 8 p.m and get up at 2 a.m and then i'd still have to get up before work for us to play oh true 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 work yes 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 so i think the solution is that everyone should just play video games 24 7 and then you just don't have to worry about this based i took a i took a year off work to play video games and it was one of the most fun things i've ever done as an adult oh i God. was not expecting it to be that much fun but <laughs> so incredibly based just take it just take it a year off i uh, i did something like that it was called not going to college <laughs> <laughs> nice <laughs> would, you, would you recommend it uh it worked out for me so but i wouldn't <laughs> recommend it uh, wait how did fish get delta back hmm. i don't know i think he just slammed it or was it loyalty no because if it were loyal it have rebelled i think he just took it back hmm <laughs> with the dark edge maybe the dark edge card you might have gotten it with just two taps that's a big momentum loss over here for kublai clan kublai i, I can't stop saying it oh my god <laughs> for, i'm just gonna say kublai for kublai for noob. noob yes noob tempo is losing <laughs> don't write the Kona emote in chat okay stop <laughs> Um, so I mean okay. like fish is holding on here what is what is um what is Under's move here what is his win condition what does he go for it's my question I feel like I would be out of here show me game three is what I would be saying what do you think he's doing Corny you like mm. hanging on what, what would you be hanging on for I like hanging on but not when it's doomed <laughs> and do you think this is doomed? Yeah, it looks pretty doomed. I mean, Tars can take Echo with the knight, right? Oh. Uh, Tars can take Valletta with the knight that he has an Echo. And then he, under the gun, can defend the city. I suppose. But then Korea can give him a run for his money while Kublai is just happily doing his own thing. Here's a question. Um, are liberations allowed? Yes. Good question. So, I mean, like, I mean, Bravo, like you said, I think you said this, Bravo is, like, really hard to take. So, if he can hang on and this Khmer army can get over here and he can start liberating cities, I think that might be their win con, right? Am I crazy? Yeah. Oh, no, you're right. 
But uh, he doesn't have to keep these cities. He can just raise them, except for the capital, of course. Mm. I mean, Echo's a raids if I ever saw one. Ooh, that's actually... Echo's definitely definitely raise Echo. I mean, this is like a garbage city. Um, but here's the thing. If he does do liberates, he gets Diplo favor, right? And that feeds into the Diplo win. Or did they did they take that out of um Oh that's true. I mean you get more more vote, more points, mm -hmm. so your chances of getting what you want are higher. And I also think the really scary thing here is the religion with Crusade. Um when Kamai does get over here. Oof. Definitely. Very true. Do we know if did anyone see any missionaries running around or was this all natural? Mm, that's a good question. I think some of it came from trade, actually. I haven't played Command forever. I, I think there was something about getting free missionaries. Okay. I don't. I don't think it, actually. I'm. I'm not, uh, no, surprised. I think. Yeah. <laughs> they're part of. Sorry. No, no. Sorry. Go ahead. And apostles. Thank you, Mike Man ninety eight. Thank you. I mean, I don't know if it's actually part of BBG. I don't think so. At least. Ooh, Corassiers out here for Kamai. This might be the timing. I think it is. The Corassiers here are going to be extremely difficult for these Huashas to deal with. Like, if we look at the damage on a... Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. But this is scary now. <laughs> he took Valletta. That means <laughs> there's still a chance that <laughs> Task and Full die. <laughs> oh, wait. It was Task that was meant to take it? I think so. I mean, yeah. I thought that was the escape plan, was for Task to take Valletta with a knight once under the gun had weakened it enough. Because imagine if, if that Valletta, imagine if that were a Grand Colombian city right now. You would feel very secure. You would feel very safe nestled in this gigantic Khmer army. But here's the thing. Um, dude, Khmer's army score is insane right now. Yeah. Yeah. This is a lot. It's turn 73. With these stats, he should be at tanks around turn 80-something. Maybe 88, maybe late 80s. So they have maybe 10 turns, 15 turns to kill fish. You think they've got 10 turns to kill fish before what? Sorry? Tank. Tanks. Tanks. What is he at? He would be at military science. Yeah, he could be at tanks pretty quick. Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> Sorry, the oh, rabbit's yeah. hungry. I'm just going to zoom out. Oh, wait, oh, it's a World Congress turn. I can't feed her yet. Um, Hello. You can take a quick minute or two. I think just vote and then run. No role playing. <laughs> <laughs> I guess there's always time for role playing, huh? <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> yep. Good sir. My mom again. Excellent. All right, good work. Go feed the bunny. Don't make her wait. Oh, it might catch fire. Oh, dude, my rabbit's on fire. I gotta go. <laughs> Tell her we say hello you as you're rescuing her. Girl. Just leave it right on the screen and we will enjoy the bloodbath. I mean... There you go. Okay, so let's see. Under the gun is on military science. Same as Noob, actually. Noob is even further along in culture, no? Or maybe under the gun just went back. She's a very hungry valley. girl. Um, I'm back. She's fed. Wow, that was really fast. I basically just like threw a handful of biscuits at her. <laughs> <laughs> Love and care.
Ooh. Okay. Ooh, okay. Kamaya's here. Cavalry are upgraded. This is good. That is not good. This is like the Clash of Titans. It looks like the favor is going to start swinging back towards um, yeah. under and fish. Yes. <laughs> I think you take the victor out of Charlie and let it rebel. <laughs> Before he can liberate it. Mm. <laughs> because it was liber uh, rebelling before, I think. It looks yeah, a bit yeah. rough. Oh, never mind. It's only 8 for loyalty from the governor, so it will still take like 60 turns. Yeah. We need more like Scorched Earth and Civ, you know? I feel like that would be... Yeah. I mean, there's plenty of that, of just placing neighborhoods on all your mines if you're losing. Ooh, I like that. I like that a lot. He also could have easily raised Charlie, but he didn't. Yeah, Fish is holding Bravo. And this might still turn out to be an interesting game, but Under the Gun is going to get his attention split with all these cavalry stepped up. Dude, I think he needs to rename Bravo to Helm's Deep. Look at that <laughs> positioning. Ooh, that's actually a big problem. If he loses his capital, I'm pretty sure all their trade routes get reset. True. Someone in chat pointed that out. That's good. I mean, Kamehameha's externals this game are not the best. Not the nets. What? The city lived on one HP! Wow. I would just type GG in the chat and I'll death four out. I wouldn't even wait for the vote. I'd be Honestly, out there. I, I, I'm kind of confused, to be honest. Why would he even want to take it? Like, that's just actually feeding a liberate. You can't raise that city. Hmm, I suppose. Maybe it was to reset the trait? I mean, you get rid of the plaza and all the buildings, yeah? Did you get rid of the traders? Fish gets metal casting next turn. The pike and shots will... Who do you think can we call our MVP so far? Is it just Snoop for the Corsa play and all the gold? Will it be under the gun for fighting 1v2 into the late game? You know... I still think it's Noob for the play. I still think it's a very creative play. And uh, I think that makes him the MVP in my book. Potato, if you're here, maybe we can also check on this again. <laughs> oh, sorry, I zoned out. <laughs> Did they actually block Senti Santas again? Is that a thing? What, what do you need me to do? Sorry. Can we no. check what happened in Congress? Yeah, what happened? Oh, uh, yes. City centers got blocked again. Oh my god. <laughs> and they lost Diplo on Khmer, actually. And they lost Diplo. <laughs> That's actually super bad. No more wind cons on the table, really. Maybe CV? Mm. It's score victory. 130. I thought it was supposed to happen, like, drive downs. Yeah, you're right. The game lies sometimes. <laughs> yeah, of course it does. Do you think do you think this is going to go to score victory then? Could very well, might. I think that 